Applause. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we ask that you please rise and remove your hats as the Carl Hayden High School Junior ROTC Color Guard presents our nation's colors. Please remain standing as Phoenix International Raceway Chaplain Ken Bowers offers our invocation. Father, it's absolutely amazing to think that you know our hearts, you know our needs, and you know what we want before we can even present it to you. But you want us to ask. So tonight, we give you thanksgiving and we ask for a safe race. Give us protection for every driver, crew member, and all who are participating. And we thank you for all of our delightful guests tonight, our fans. This we pray in your name, and everyone said, Amen. Now, here to perform our national anthem, please welcome from the popular country rock band Daisy Train, Arizona's very own Kathy Rankin, accompanied by John Bronson. Oh, say can you see It's the elimination race of the round of eight, meaning only four drivers at night's end will have a chance at the championship. And of course, a full moon at a racetrack. You never know what's going to happen.
be hard to put in words what a championship would mean to me. You can't put that in words. That's what I've been working for my entire life. There it goes. You beat the best, baby. You beat the best at Bristol. The ultimate goal is to win the championship at the end of the year. Always seen that trophy over my head, and Miami is definitely the end goal for this year. We have to take a step by step, and then we can put all our minds together for Humps. Championship dreams still alive for eight drivers. Seven of the eight still looking for their first championship. Only one could be a repeat champion. Before we get the command, let's go trackside to Mike Massaro. Rick, Blake Cook has been described as the Cinderella of this Xfinity Series chase, and rightly so because it has truly been a fairy tale story. A year ago, this team didn't even exist. Now, he could be just 200 laps away from earning a championship berth. Blake told me earlier this week, in order to make that happen, he feels like he needs to run inside the top five this year, something he hasn't done all season long. He's off to a good start, though. He'll roll off fourth here tonight, Dave. 2016 has been a transition year for Justin Allgaier. He turned 30. He stepped back from the Sprint Cup Series, but his move was to a team that was moving in the right direction. Junior Motorsports has given Justin Allgaier a chance to run for the championship if he can get through Phoenix here today. He starts ninth, Marty. Dave, this entire chase, Eric Jones and his race team have shown championship speed, but they have had a chase filled with problems. The one question that surrounds the 20 team, can they have a clean race start to finish tonight? Chris Gabart, his crew chief, told me earlier this week, listen, since our Kentucky wreck, I've had to back him down with his aggressiveness. If we can make it through tonight, we'll unleash that aggressive next week at Homestead, Miami. Kelly. Mexican driver Daniel Suarez comes to this race at the top of the chase grid, 17 points to the good, but that doesn't mean they plan to run conservatively tonight. Daniel told me that he's just not the type of driver to go out there after top 10, top 15. This team wants to continue its streak of six straight top five finishes again tonight. He rolls off six. It's time now for the command. And now for the most famous words in motorsports, please welcome your grand marshal, three-time Olympian and three-time medalist in recurve archery, Brady Ellison. Drivers, start your engines! This is it. The engines are fired. Blake Cook, he has been all smiles all season long. Will he be smiling at the end of this race and have a chance at a championship in Miami next week?
NASCAR on NBCSN is brought to you by Ford. We go further so you can. Xfinity. Change the way you experience TV with Xfinity X1. And by Credit One Bank, the official credit card of NASCAR. If you're in the last corner and that one spot in front of you is what's going to advance you to the next round, you got to take it. I didn't want to do what I did at the end, but there's a championship on the line, and I kept it as clean as I possibly could. Ryan Newman is going to get in with that move on the last lap. I wouldn't do a dang thing different than Ryan did. That's awesome. No mark on the car, and then he runs into the fence. You have to make that move and pay the consequences of Homestead if that comes around. If you needed that spot to get in the chase. You have to do it for your team, you have to do it for yourself, your sponsors. I know that there are guys that are in our chase that would do whatever it takes to make it to the next round. You got a shot to make the championship and you don't have to wreck a guy for it. He finishes one spot behind me and I'm in the chase. Oh, hell yes, I'd do it. That's a big question. What would you do and what will you do tonight to have a shot at the championship? Be a part of the championship four. Let's take a look at the starting lineup today up front. Kyle Busch won the poll, but right next to him, it's Eric Jones, a 20-year-old out of Byron, Michigan. Started top three in all five Phoenix starts. His worst finish here, sixth. Yeah, behind in the row, too, we have two drivers that had their best qualifying efforts of the year. In timely fashion, Ryan Reed, Blake Cook. In row three, we have two chase drivers with Dar very different situations. Darrell Wallace, Jr., 20 points below the cut line. Daniel Suarez with the biggest margin above at plus 17. Back in row four, a couple drivers doing double duty. They'll race in the Sprint Cup race tomorrow as well. But Alex Bowman, this is a little bit of a home race for him as he is from Tucson, Arizona. In row five, we have two junior motorsports cars. Jason Algar is one point behind where he needs to be. Elliott Sadler, 16 points to the good to make the final round. Row six, we have Brad Keselowski and Dakota Armstrong. Brad Keselowski trying to get that 22 in victory lane for the first time this season. Back in row seven, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. making his first Xfinity Series start since 2013. He is a two-time Xfinity Series champion, 29-year-old out of Olive Branch, Mississippi. In row eight, we have Ryan Sieg starting next to, next to Brandon Jones, who has one start here at Phoenix, finished 11th in March. In row nine, we have Eric Amarola and Corey LaJoy. Eric Amarola won his last time he started this series in Daytona back in July. And back in row 10, Justin Marks and Cole Wentz picking up that row. In row 11, we have Ross Chastain starting next to Ty Dillon. Ty has six starts here in Phoenix, and all of them are top tens. In row 12, we have Jeremy Clements and hometown kid J.J. Yaley. And back in row 13, it's Ryan Priest and Brendan Gaughan. Brendan Gaughan, a must-win situation if he wants to have a chance at the championship next week. And we want to welcome in one of the Chase competitors, Jeff Dallium, up on the radio. Hey, Blake, is Jeff up here in the booth? You with us? I got you, Jeff. But you and your team have done such a good job this year of getting into this position. Are you all ready to take on the biggest teams in this series? I'm ready, man. Uh, first off, I think it's so cool that I'm talking to you right now, sitting on the second row. I'm about to give it everything I got. I'm probably the biggest race of my career. I'm taking advantage of it. Well, we'll be watching. It's uh, going to be fun to watch. Good luck to you and your team both. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. And thank you, Lead Filter. Everybody from Lead Filter, thank you. And you can't see him smiling, but I'm sure he is still smiling uh, inside of that helmet. We're going to ride along with a few different drivers. And Jeff, why don't you let us know who some of them will be? Yeah, we just heard Blake how excited he is. He's starting in fourth position. We have the Snoko in car camera. Then in the front row, we're riding along with the Toyota camera with Eric Jones. Yeah, Brad Keselowski starting back in 11th will carry the Ford in-car camera. And Brendan Poole all the way back in 14th carrying the DC Solar onboard camera. These are going to be some great shots. First time under the lights in a long time here at Phoenix. You mentioned under the lights. It will give us some great perspectives and some great shots. We'll also have aerial coverage provided by our partners at Smithfield Foods. Very unique racetrack here. A dog leg on the back stretch, making for interesting racing because they don't have to stay on the track on the back stretch. They can come all the way down on the apron. They can cut from turn two to turn three in a straight line, which 
would eliminate that dog leg. Take a look at the race analysis for tonight's race. 200 laps, 200 miles, pit road speed, 45 miles per hour, and that fuel window, 85 to 90 laps. The pace car has made its way off the track. The field in the hands of Kyle Busch and Eric Jones in row one. Kyle Busch on the outside, Eric Jones on the inside. The elimination race is underway. See behind them, they're already piling up, running into the back of each other. Eric Jones has the advantage as he comes out through the dog leg and into three. Can Kyle Busch close the door? He's going to get in behind him. And a valuable point there for Eric Jones if he's able to hold on and lead this first lap. And sure enough, he will. These drivers will be looking for every possible point that they can get tonight. Right here, this is the example right here. You mentioned that big bailout down there at the bottom of the 88 right there, the orange and black car with Alex Bowman. He was the first car we've seen use it. You saw the sparks fly as the car bottomed out. Bubba Wallace in the six. Darrell Wallace Jr. running on high side. Darrell Wallace Jr., another driver trying to make it into the championship four. Blake Cook right there in the 11, Ryan Reed in the 16, both with their career, or excuse me, season best qualifying spots, holding on to those spots early, those valuable points, proving that they deserve to go on to the championship four in Miami. And you see Austin Dillon, it looks like to me he was being very careful behind Ryan Reed, not wanting to get into an incident with a guy trying to make the chase. I thought he could have easily dropped down to that bottom and pushed the issue into turn three, but he didn't do it. I think that's just respect for those guys. And battle for the lead as Kyle Busch will take the top spot away from Eric Jones. This is the patience we're going to have to see out of Eric Jones. He, I know he wants to go win this race and outrun his mentor, Kyle Busch, but that isn't what he needs to do. What he needs to do is focus on the big picture, understand that Miami is the goal, and it's going to come down to points if he can't have the race win. At the start of the race, it was Eric Jones that was able to jump out front, but at the start of the race, it looked like there was a little bit of a bottleneck on the start, take a look all the way back to where Brendan Gaughan was. Yeah, it was. You can't see. When you're the car, you see the 98 car. It all started with him. He can't see the leader when he goes. You're kind of guessing when the leader goes. And it, they checked up in front of him. He was trying to accelerate, had to slow down, and everybody behind him had to make evasive action to try to keep him running in the back of him. Here's what he had to say on the radio after that start. Should be clear. It was a checkup. I just had to avoid him. Well, all good. And again, Brendan Gaughan and Shane Wilson, his crew chief, they're going to do whatever they can. They're going to try any strategy. They're going to do anything different that they can to win this race because they are in a must-win situation. Dave? And they're a long way behind right now, Rick, on the track. And one of the things they reminded him after that incident was tire management, please. He's way in the back right now. He needs to save those tires when he for when he needs them to be very good against the others. And, and they reminded him, we have time. Even though it's a short race, don't waste it all here at the beginning. Brendan Gaughan has South Point Hotel and Casino on there, a family business. They've been involved in the hotel and casino business for all of Brendan Gaughan's life. His grandfather started in Vegas in the casino business, and his father's taken over from that. Brendan Gaughan has always had a passion for racing. It started in off-road racing and has moved now into stock car racing. Blake Cook in the 11. Look at Just Ryan Reed. He's all the way on the bottom of the racetrack, literally four tires below that yellow line. We, you know, I made the comment that Austin Dillon, I thought, was being very careful behind Ryan, but Ryan has found about a car length advantage over Austin, and Austin's not been able to close it up. Look at the interesting lines in the inner turn. This is the back straight. I don't call it a straight. It's really a dog leg. <laughs> yeah. But watch the 16 car as he goes to the bottom of the racetrack. This time he doesn't do it, but he's had literally all four tires below that yellow line. Marty. And running in the top five, they certainly know that's what they need to do tonight and trying a completely different setup than they've ever had here in the past. I talked to Ryan about that earlier today, and he said when we were here at Phoenix in the spring, we knew we could not come back like that. So you'll notice the Roush Fenway group brought Ricky Stenhouse Jr. here this weekend. 
and one of their R&D engineering groups is crew chiefing that car, and they bought a completely different setup that all three of the Roush Fenway cars are using, and it's paying dividends. You see Ryan running very low on the track, trying to catch that 11 car, and Ryan said, we're the best we've ever been at Phoenix. If we want to have a shot to advance to Miami with a chance to win this title, we've got to finish in the top five today. Right now, he's where he needs to be. And constantly you will see on the left of your screen the chase points making you aware of who is in and who is out as they run on the racetrack. And riding along with Blake Cook, he is currently fourth. But the top chaser right now is the 20 of Eric Jones. Eric Jones chasing after Kyle Busch for the win here at Phoenix. Watch Chase for the NASCAR Xfinity Series Championship with the NBC Sports app. Get closer with additional camera angles, driver stats, and track information. You can watch live anywhere on any device. Find out more at NBCSports.com slash live. Kyle Busch out front has a two-and-a-half second lead over Eric Jones and working on some of the slower traffic. It's Eric Jones, Daniel Suarez. Blake Cook, Austin Dillon, and Ryan Reed running back in the sixth position. Yeah, Austin Dillon got by Ryan Reed. Some lap trap was involved. He, they all came up on the 74 car, and Ryan tried to get to the bottom, but he lost so much momentum in trying to do that that Austin Dillon jumped on the outside and cleared him on the exit of turn two. With Ryan Reed running so well, currently up in the sixth position. Look at all the congestion. Yeah, and as we were watching there, Austin Dillon got by Blake Cook. Now Ryan Reed's attacking him. And look right behind Ryan Reed. We're going to talk about this battle really all night long because when you look at the chase standings, the two drivers that are closest to one another, that 11, that white and green 11 of Blake Cook and that bright blue seven car, two cars behind him of Justin Allgaier. They're only separated currently by three points. That Remember, that's only three positions. I want to take a look at this week's Ford drive to the championship. Ryan Reed said currently running six, five top ten finishes in the last 13 races. Well, he got exceptionally yep. loose getting into turn one right there. And 
he had to go way up the racetrack and loose on braking and corner entry into turn one is very difficult to deal with right now he's trying to shove as much front brake into the car as he can get to try to keep the car from being loose kid in the corner you see he drives in a corner he's where he needs to be but right there the car starts to come around on him and nice save the only thing a driver can do is back his entry speed up and try to get more front brake put into the car to try to keep the rear tires from driving the car loose under braking and as quickly as that happened, the 7 took over the position, which put the 7 one spot behind the 11. That means now only two points separate those two drivers. Marty. Yeah, Ryan Reed's fallen back to 5th to 7th in the last couple laps, and at least he hasn't lost his sense of humor after that little slide that we just saw. It came on the radio and said, uh, in case you guys didn't notice, I'm a little loose entering the corner. So happy behind the wheel, but dealing with a very loose race car right now. Yeah, and Steve only 20 laps into a run that's concerning because Very normally it gets worse as the run goes on and you just if you can't put front brake in it to help it if that doesn't fix it then the only thing you can do is slow down and that kills your lap time <laughs> slow down racing what are you talking about jeff that doesn't it's happen. that a wreck take your pick i'll take slower for 200 laps alex <laughs> <laughs> so kyle bush has maintained about a two and a half second lead over Eric Jones again a win and you advance mentality for all the chase drivers but with Kyle Busch out front he could be stealing one of those opportunities to win and advance for some updates from pit road we start with Marty Snyder Rick we saw Eric Jones lead those first three laps getting critical bonus points that'll certainly help him to get to Miami with a shot to win the title and he said the car way too loose on landing right now Chris Gabart said that might not be a bad thing. I think that's going to come to us as the run goes along. And the spotter said, actually, I think he's turning a little more right than he is left going through the corner. Loose race car right now for Eric Jones, but in second. Kelly. Well, his teammate Daniel Suarez started six, is up three positions. Don't forget, he won the truck series race last night. And even though these vehicles drive considerably differently, he said that he did learn a lot about what this track would do here at night. He said it changes dramatically, and he relayed that information to his team. Right now, Daniel saying that he started off a little bit loose. Now he's getting tight through the center, both ends of the team, reminding him to stay focused on his lines, not on the 20 ahead of him, Mike. Lots of eyes on Blake Cook, Kelly, this week. He's the Cinderella story so far of this championship chase. I spoke with him earlier this week, and he was pretty honest about the situation. He said, if I'm going to move on and be a championship contender in Homestead, everyone on this team needs to step it up, especially me. Asked about what he needs to do a little bit different. He said, I need to be less patient with passing, be more aggressive setting up lap cars, and be better on restarts. And he ended the conversation by saying, I need to prove I belong in the championship race in home It's pretty good right now. Just uh, a little bit tight through one and two. Dave? Justin Allgaier looking pretty aggressive there in the seven car right behind him. Justin's numbers here very good. Three top fives in 12 starts, including a fourth place here in March. He needs to be that good or better to advance to the championship round at Miami. Right now, he's got his sights set on Blake Cook. Trying to get by Blake Cook for that one spot, that one point. That'll change everything. They will end up being tied if Allgaier can go around Blake Cook. Kyle Busch still out front.
Welcome back to Phoenix. Let's we'll listen in on spotter communication. I only hear one car consistently shifting in one and two. It's a 62. I did hear, I think, the seven earlier in the race try it, but right now just the 62. Those lap times are dynamite. That was spotter coverage presented by Liberty Mutual Insurance, helping drivers worry less. The interesting thing about the spotters in this racetrack is that they are down there in turns one and two, so they can really hear the drivers shifting in the middle one and two. It's normally the spotters are on the front straightaway, but here they're further down. So shifting doesn't sound you know normal because it isn't. We don't see a lot of tracks, but there's this unique circumstances we ride on board of Brad Keselowski. We're mostly in traffic. From what we understand in the garage here, it's mostly traffic. So in an instance right now, you see Brad drive underneath that car above him. And he didn't that time. He kept both hands on the wheel, but he has the opportunity to go down, put the car up in the third gear. It's not as smooth as you want it to be because there's a minimum ratio split they have to run yet, but it just helps you get more acceleration off the corner. The question is, I would think it would make it freer off having that much more rear gear to try to exit the corner. Well, I, I think the thing is, you, I always believe it didn't make it freer off because I could feel the rear wheels. Okay. In other words, I could feel the tires start to spin just a little bit. With the higher gear, I couldn't feel the rear tires. I was spinning the rear tires, but that's just a driver preference. And big loose right there. Yeah, you saw big Brad big. having to really work the wheel, but you know, the reason you can shift is because in turns one and two, the RPM drop is so much. The RPMs go way down. It enables you to shift as opposed to three and four. You do not see, you can see right there, it fell to about 6,000 RPMs. So as we ride with Brad Keselowski into turn one, let's see how many RPMs it loses. It ups, it's up to about 8,300. So it gets down in the corner. It's down to 57, something like that. Yeah. So that's why you can shift in one and two and not in three and four. The battle for the top four in points between Justin Allgaier and Blake Cook right now is going to Allgaier because Blake Cook has fallen back a spot. Allgaier up to fifth. Blake Cook running seventh right now. Mike. And Rick, Blake Cook told me earlier this week, he said the only way we're going to be able to earn that championship berth is if we find a way to run inside the top five tonight. That's something he hasn't done all season long. Started there, though, started fourth, but as you just mentioned, he has fallen back to seventh. Right now, that's because the balance of the race car just a little bit tight on exit. They're going to have to free that car up on their first stop. You see at the back of this pack, or right kind of in the middle of this pack, the one of Elliott Sadler. Not a very flashy night running in 11th, as you see Tara Wallace Jr. throw some sparks down. But the one, I, I, we, we talked to this team really all weekend long. I spent some time with Kevin Mendering this morning, and he said, listen, it's going to be unimpressive. Our goal is to not make headlines. We, we, we've worked very hard. We've gained the points. We came in with a points cushion of 16. Don't put ourselves in a position where another car can make a mistake, spin out, and take us out. So you see right here, three wide. But he took his time to get to the bottom of this three wide. Now he's going to shoot the dog leg, try to clear him. But he's kind of running with a little bit of gap, Marty, like not really pushing the issue, leaving his competitors a little extra room. Being very careful. And, and obviously they have the points cushion, Steve. But also, you know what? Elliot Sattler has been burned by this racetrack. He said, I've won here before, but twice this place has broken my heart. He's come here in a championship battle two times. Two times he's left here out of that championship battle. So tonight he told me, listen, I just want things to be clean. I'm not going to push the issue. I'm going to be very careful. We're going to have very conservative pit strategy. We just want to get to Miami with a shot to win it all. So he knows how to win here at Phoenix, but he also knows that he can have trouble here as well. Battle for the lead, Rick. Yeah, as the congestion now in front of the 18, Kyle Busch has so many cars in front of him, he's got to pick a line. And that has enabled the 20 of Eric Jones to close the gap once again. And all the way down on the apron, actually two lines below the apron, was the 18 of Kyle Busch to get by these cars. Rarely do you see the commitment cone become an issue when you're <laughs> running three and four in Phoenix, but the 18 was only about a half a groove above the commitment. Uh, uh, behind him, we're riding around with Eric Jones, and he can't do that. No. I mean, he can't afford to make that move. I think that's a big disadvantage for the Xfinity regulars on a week-to-week on a -week basis. They can't afford to be that aggressive. Look at Kyle Busch. He's three car widths below the yellow line. A lot of people would think, oh, he's going to pit road. He's, he's already decided to go to pit road. No, he's actually racing down there. But, you know, what concerns me a little bit about Elliott Sadler, we talked about how Elliott's trying to be calm and make sure he's methodical, but that's got him in the hornet's nest. Like, I'm not so sure you're just better off just 
dig it. Like, just go and be who you are and get in front of that mess. So, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I understand there's a strategy. I understand you don't want to make a mistake and get yourself in a wreck. But at the same time, that really slow and calm and all that has him right where he doesn't want to be. That prevent defense that you always see prevent the football defense. team. You never want to go to that. Well, how about if you go all the way down two lines below the yellow line on the apron? That's where Kyle Busch is running. Caution is out. Debris on the racetrack. Let's go to Mike. And Blake Cook will be a taker on pit road. You had seen he dropped outside the top five and was uh, struggling a little bit off the corner. Very tight on exit. They're going to try to free him up with a track bar adjustment here. You can see the wrench going in the rear window now. Also four Goodyear Eagles and Sunoco race fuel for Blake Cook. Dave? Justin Allgaier moving the right direction from ninth at the start to fifth. This car really, really, really tight in the center of the corner, Marty. Dave, Chris Gabehart was correct. The track came to Eric Jones. He was free at the early part of the run. Got just a little bit tight at the very end of it. They were very happy with it, though. Four tires and a wedge adjustment, Kelly. Daniel Suarez pitted from the fourth position. Position. He said he was a little bit tight on landing and starting to get a little bit loose off. It was four sticker Goodyears for Daniel Suarez. Take a look at the race off pit road brought to you by Geico. Pretty good run for Kyle Busch holding on to that top spot. Austin Dillon gains a spot. Eric Jones loses a position.
NASCAR on NBCSN is brought to you by Liberty Mutual Insurance, helping drivers worry less on the track and on the road. That is the spotter stand, and here's a perspective from behind the spotters how they see this racetrack. And you see how difficult turns three and four are. <clears throat> One and two is right below the <clears throat> right below them. But three and four, you see how far down they are. When they go down into three and four, especially in the bottom of the racetrack, definitely where the 18 car was running. I don't believe any of the spotters could see the cars at all. 11 of Blake Cook needing to have a great race tonight, and that means they've got to be good on pit road. Might not have had their best pit stop on this first stop. Yeah, you can see right here, watch the left front. Little hang up right here. He's late getting the lug lids on, late getting the wheel on. Lost him some spots. Yeah, and that's Weston Lovejoy, the front tire changer. I spoke with crew chief Chris Rice about that. He said, yeah, he missed a couple of lug nuts there. Uh, obviously, they need to be uh, a little bit more polished up the rest of the night, guys. In seventh out 11th, four spots. That's two rows on the restart. So listen into the radio. We let the nerves be the first stop. These boys are going to be funny on the last stop. Go get what you can get right here. Get them hot. It's all good, boys. Deep breath. It felt good being up there for a little while. I like it. I'm ready. A little while? You mean you're going to be up there all night? Well, I'm on my way back up right now. Green flag back out. Kyle Busch and Austin Dillon making up row one. Sparks flying once again as everyone cutting the corner. Oh, and into the wall hard. 88. That's the 88 of Alex Bowman. Hold up. And fire from underneath the hood. Looked like there were sparks going like perhaps his left front was flat. Yeah, he said something broke. Yeah. He was running 14th. And when that last caution came out, there was actually some contact between the 88 and the 97 of Josh Balicki. You see, Alex Bowman has climbed out of the 88, but this was earlier. This was the last caution. Watch this. Yeah, Balicki is really slow in that white 97, and here comes Bowman and just kind of was going so much faster than Balicki. Didn't expect Balicki to be turning left, and they made contact, so it's hard to believe that that didn't have something to do with this. Right there, you can see, obviously, sparks flying out from underneath it. And guys, they said that there was no real damage on that right rear from that contact earlier with the 97 car. And they said, the spotter said just now, I think that the uh, right rear is still up when it was going into the wall. So I don't think the right rear went down to cause that accident. They do think something broke on the race car. Yeah, it looks like the left front. It looks like you see the sparks, see everything coming off the left front tire. So I don't think that contact had anything to do. Well, no inner liners. So when that tire goes flat, the car goes right on the racetrack. That's the first bad thing that's happened to Alex Bowman. He's on the pole for the cup race tomorrow.
NASCAR Drive is NASCAR.com's live race day companion. Select your in-car video or camera angle, access integrated driver stats, lap-by-lap commentary, and social conversation all in real time. You won't miss a lap when you visit NASCAR.com slash drive on your personal computer now. It's the Ticket Galaxy 200. The current drivers that are below the cut line, Ryan Reed, Blake Cook, Darrell Wallace Jr., and Brendan Gaughan. We mentioned Brendan Gaughan, a must-win situation. Darrell Wallace really in that same boat. Blake Cook, though, started off above the cut line and now is below the cut line, as is Ryan Reed. Dave. Hey, guys. uh, Brendan Gaughan came back down pit road to put some tape back on the brake ducts. Crew Chief Shane Wilson told me, yeah, we got just a little carried away on pulling tape on that first stop, so we put a little bit back. We also topped the car off with fuel, and Steve, you and I were talking about it earlier today. This team starting back as far as they did, they'll be off strategy from the start. Options are good, and now he's got a little bit more fuel than a lot of the racers, than a lot of the chasers. You know, Dave, that's their only option. Shane Wilson uh, has a lot of experience on the pit box, a lot of experience with Brendan Gone. They've seen some success in the truck series, and he knows that Reality is they're 21st. Reality is they haven't driven up into the top 10, so he's going to have to just try to continue to give themselves opportunity, and that may not seem like coming to get fuel after just a couple laps, but you never know when the next caution is going to fall. That could be what opens up his chances. And again, they're going to try everything they can because they're in a must-win situation. But right now it's Kyle Busch who's been dominating in the desert. Two by two, they're lined up behind Kyle Busch and Austin Dillon up there in row number one as we get ready for the restart. Xfinity Series racing from Phoenix International Raceway. And Alex Bowman has been checked and released from the infield care center, and Dave's down there. And Rick, hard for us to diagnose sometimes what's going on with the car there. What did you feel before it went away from you there? Uh, we had a flat left front, so I, I don't know what, how I got out of the car. I mean, obviously, we blew a tire again in the corner, right? It just went straight, but. I got out of the car and looked down, left front's flat, so 
don't know what happened there. Brand new left front tire just failed, so we ran something over or something, but really unfortunate. Hate it for all these guys. We had a, a new sponsor, a huge general contractors on the car. And everybody at Junior Motorsports works really hard. Great Hendrick horsepower under the hood. And got to thank Cessna for all their support. Dave was making good changes. Just uh, shouldn't have been that far back to begin with. And, and to, uh, to cut a tire, obviously something happened. So. Glad Alex is okay. Walk from the Care Center under zone power, guys. And you know, Rick, what could happen right after a pit stop? We'll have to see on that wheel. But at times, the tire change, it can easily hit the valve stem. Maybe not break it off, but just crack it, bend it, start letting air out. Then it gets to a certain point where it gets low enough on air, the tire fails. And, and Steve, we did confirm with the team that it was a left front valve stem that came off. So you nailed it. That's what happened on the stop. And it's time for the restart. Again, Kyle Busch, race leader, into the restart zone. Big run from the 20 of Eric Jones as he moves to the outside of Austin Dillon, fighting for that second spot. Eric Jones is going to pass Austin Dillon on the high side, and Jones moves up to second. Daniel Suarez tucked in behind the two of Austin Dillon now. Great battle there with teammates, Darrell Walls Jr. and Ryan Reed. I think one of the better races we've seen was Roush Duo, really. I mean, they haven't really performed that well this year. And also, Rick Stenhouse Jr., he's in the middle of it as well. Three wide. Blake Cook on the very bottom. Trying to make some spots back up. That's after that. right there. Yeah, had Sorry. a little bit slower of a pit stop. It's so difficult when you run that very bottom the way you saw Blake running. Eventually, you got to get back on the racetrack and got exceptionally tight coming off turn four. Well, Ricky Stenhouse knew it, and he took the lane. He said, well, you went down there. I'm going to take the lane you're going to need, and made it much more difficult for the 11. Take another look. See the 11 underneath the 60, and eventually you got to find your way on the racetrack. The 60 is using all, you know, using the left sides on the yellow line. So right here, the 11's got to get back on the racetrack. And, Light contact. Blake Cook, he knows he has to make those spots up. He understands the position he's in, so I'm not surprised to see him be that aggressive. Yeah, because Justin Allgaier is doing what he needs to do. He's running in the fifth position, four points ahead of Blake Cook. You see the points. Those four points, you know, you talk about risk versus reward and how, you know, Daniel Suarez couldn't run down there. Eric Jones couldn't run down there because of what they're racing for. Well, now I think Blake Cook feels like he's going to have to go down there because he's now have to switch from defense to offense to try to make points up on the seven. And this race is going fast. Already 67 laps complete on lap 68 of 200. So not a lot of time to make up the positions. Kelly. And you'll see Daniel Suarez there also trying to make a move uh, to get around the two of Austin Dillon. He continues to improve his point situation now up 22. That's five better than he entered this race. And when I talked to his crew chief, Scott Grace, about their approach to this race, he said, look, we really still got to push. Their intentions are to go into Miami uh, having yet another top five. They've already got six straight top five finishes. He's the only driver to have a top five in every chase race. He says it's really important to keep the team momentum high and to kind of uh, let the other chase competitors, the other three that will potentially join him in Miami, uh, know that they mean business. Kelly, it was interesting talking with the seven crew this weekend. Jason Burdett, the crew chief, told me that even though their short track program was one of the highlights of the Junior Motorsports team this year, they went away from what they've been doing all season long and tried something new. Why? Because fourth or maybe fifth wasn't going to be good enough. They weren't sure. So they had to try to do something to make this car a winner instead. Jason's been very happy with what they've done this weekend, and now it's just tuning on it for the race to make sure they can stay up front and potentially go for the race win. Well, the other chase driver is the six of Daryl Wallace Jr. If you remember back, it wasn't that long ago. In 2013, Daryl Wallace Jr. won the truck race at Martinsville. And with that win, he became the first African-American driver since Wendell Scott to win a race. And Wendell Scott won way back in 1963. So it had been over four decades since an African-American had won in NASCAR, and it was Darrell Wallace Jr. 
that was able to accomplish that. Mike? And uh, it's been an emotional week already for Daryl Wallace, Rick. Earlier this week, he lost his grandmother uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, and by the generosity of Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Brad Keselowski, they provided transportation for him to be there with her uh, by her side. Before the race, this was the scene, emotional as Daryl got aboard the race car. You can see just above the driver's seat, Granny Jan is there instead of Daryl Wallace. He is honoring her this week. It's interesting. He had a conversation with his mom earlier this week. His mom told him, you always do better when you honor someone. Perplexed, Daryl said, what do you mean? He said, well, uh, she said, well, when your aunt passed away, you won the k &N series. You also mentioned, as we see a pass on the track for third place, Daryl... Uh, Daniel Suarez going underneath Austin Dillon. We get back to the story on Daryl Wallace. His mother told him, when you honor people, you do well. When he honored Wendell Scott in Martinsville, that victory you alluded to, he won that race. Now, his mother says, go win this race here tonight for Granny Jan. And believe me, it's on his mind. I spoke with him before the race, and he said, it's amazing when somebody else is taking the wheel insinuating that his grandmother's actually driving the race car. Meanwhile, Daniel Suarez and Huston Dillon side by side for third here on the racetrack. And this battle for third is pretty impressive what Austin's been able to do on that outside lane. We're starting to see the groove widen out a little bit. Not something I was expecting, but Austin Dillon's making really good lap time in that second groove. I think the 19's a little bit quicker, but every time the 19 gets underneath him, there's enough grip in that outside where Austin can fend him off. Austin. Back up into the third spot. Suarez drops back to fourth. But Kyle Busch has already led 72 of the 75 laps that have been completed and still has about a two, a two and a half second lead over second place Eric Jones. That's been the gap virtually since the drop of the green flag. Yeah, Steve, I think there's a lot of Cub drivers watching this race right now getting excited about seeing that two car run that outside lane. You know, the cup cars with less downforce seem to be able to widen the track out a little bit more than these Xfinity cars do. So that's an interesting change of the racetrack. We could see the groove widen out tonight, but see it continue to widen out even more tomorrow. On lap 78 of 200. Battle for third continuing. Here comes Suarez once again to the inside of Dillon. But this is where it's difficult. So he can beat Austin Dillon to the middle of the corner. But Austin Dillon, if he can stay on his right rear quarter panel, now this time he can. He got a little tight in the middle of the corner, slid up, and that allowed Daniel Suarez to use the entire racetrack on corner exit. That was the real big difference in that set of corners. Brennan Poole's running back in the 14th position. He's 11 seconds behind Kyle Busch. As we ride along with Brennan Poole, great perspective here. It is, and it shows you just how much these cars move around. You saw Elliot Sadler right out the front windshield here, how much he chased that car through one and two. So watch as we head down into turn three. That lap car down on the apron is going to come up onto the racing surface. Elliot Sadler is going to have to move up a line. Does it a really nice job, but not losing his momentum. But that's a great perspective right at the driver's sight line. Yeah, this DC solo camera is really fun to watch because you can really understand the differences on the both ends of the racetrack. So this is the back straightaway. You enter that dog leg, very, very ch big change of banking. Now you drive into turn three, a very flat corner that lasts forever. This is where we've seen people running all four tires below that yellow line. You see how Brennan rolled the middle very well using the bottom, but Elliot Satter used that higher lane to help his exit. Now turn one, heavy braking. A very sharp corner, turn sharp, now start accelerating. Two completely different corners. Just a couple spots in front of Brennan Poole is the 11 of Blake Cook. He's running 11. He's going to have to do better if he wants to have a chance at the championship next weekend.
Tomorrow, Sunday Night Football, live from Foxborough. Russell Wilson and the Seahawks visit Tom Brady and the Patriots. Dan Patrick, Mike Tirico, they host Football Night in America, beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern only on NBC. You know, since Tom Brady has returned, they are 4-0. You don't say. I knew I was going to tell you something that you've heard before. Aerial coverage provided by our partners at Smithfield Foods. As we look down on leader Kyle Busch, want to listen into spotter communication. The one of Elliott Sadler. Now. 790, a lot of 70s. Leader now. Team point cushion to the 11 right now. Okay, Silver, thank you for the update. Okay, Silver, man, just cruise right here. We got a 13 point cushion, so it's got to race smart. Slower up top, two in front. That was spotter coverage presented by Liberty Mutual Insurance, helping drivers worry less. Now, Elliott Sadler, what an incredible story that he is actually writing as we are watching it. But the 41-year-old out of Emporia, Virginia, he started in the Xfinity Series back in 1995, but then made the move to the Cup Series in 1998, had three wins and 435 Sprint Cup Series starts, moved around, ran truck races, then settled back in in the Xfinity Series where he has 13 wins. He has wins in all three series, but still searching for that first championship. Party. And being a kid from South Boston, Virginia, he told me earlier this week to have a shot at any NASCAR championship would mean so much. And you think about Elliott Sadler's year. In July, he lost his longtime sponsor, One Main. In August, he got him back. And he told me in that month, he said, I didn't know if I was going to be back or anything. So I have such an appreciation for the chance to maybe run for a championship. You heard the spot of Brett Griffin a moment ago talking about how the race car is right now. Elliott says, way loose right now. But Brett said, hey, just ride. He asked Kevin Mandering for the points update on Channel 2. He said, we have that 13-point cushion, but that's another point right now if he can get by that 11 car. But for this man to have a shot to win the title would mean so much, especially, Rick, when you consider the year that he's been through. Absolutely. Yeah, and, when, you know, the one thing that concerns me about Elliott Sadler is I know he doesn't have the best handling race car out there, but the brake temperature, if you look inside the left front wheel here on corner entry, look how bright the front rotors are on this car. They're bright, bright red. And while we normally see that at night, that's not outside the normal. You see it more perhaps at Richmond, not really here at Phoenix as the caution's on the racetrack. And that would be my concern is it looks like there's a right front tire down. So Elliott Sadler on that one, they're going to have to make sure they cool the brakes enough so they don't damage a tire. Potentially melting a bead as we see a lot of damage to the right side for Jeff Green getting into the wall and bringing out the caution for the third time tonight. Uh, looks pretty bad there. He was two laps down running in the 29th position. Jeff Green, former champion in the Xfinity Series. Right front tire. You hear him said, he said blew a right front tire. You know, so without a doubt, he could have run something over. But also, you know, we talk about that brake heat. And, you know, that heat of that rotor, it comes out of that rotor right into the wheel. And it, it can easily melt the bead where that tire and the wheel make contact together. So we see right here kind of corner exit he's already high Jeff the right front tire has obviously gone down yeah when the right front goes down there's nothing you can do and you know the other thing with Elliott Sadler's car the handling of it we've been hearing that he's loose so if you're loose then you keep putting front brake to it and guess what that puts more front heat into it so that just the problem just continues to magnify itself to illustrate a little better what you're talking about Steve that brake heat and the potential for melting beads let's go to the NASCAR heat evolution animation and take a look at this brake heat. Yeah, so we saw just the tremendous amount of temperature in Elliott Sadler's brake. Well, that's basically created, it's, it's, it's a disc type brake system. So as that disc spins, the driver steps on the brake pedal, it clamps those pads on the rotor. That slows the car down, but it creates a tremendous amount of heat, Jeff. It does. All that heat goes into that rotor. Then as the rotor spins, the heat dissipates itself through the rotor fins and it blows that heat directly on the wheel. And then that wheel, of course, it's touching the tire. That heat transfers into the tire and actually melts the bead and, des and destroys the tire and all the air immediately comes out of it. That was again the NASCAR Heat Evolution, uh, which is now available at all major retailers. Let's listen in to Kyle Busch's radio. I would adjust for it though, would not. 10-4. Thinking uh, Al Sharpton here, Al Sharpton when it's open. Lady Gaga if you prefer that. I'm going to go with code. Uh, on that one as far as what the team has decided they will do yeah i'm not sure which is 
the decision. But I would say with only, you know, it's been about uh, 45 laps since I've been on pit road last. We probably will see the leaders pit. But I think this is an opportunity for Brendan Gaughan way back in 18th to decide to do something different, maybe stay on the racetrack. Field making its way onto pit road. Mike. And Darrell Wallace knows he needs a victory tonight to advance and become championship eligible next week. The car just too free right now. They're going to make a wedge adjustment both sides of the race car right now. Also a four-tire change with air pressure. Dave? Justin Allgaier called his fifth-place car skatey on entry, then tight in the center and tight off. Four Goodyear tires in Sunoco fuel, Marty. Dave, going to be a long stop for the 20 team. Eric Jones slid through his pit. They had to push him back. You see all the cars going by him on pit road. It's going to be four tires. Said the car started way too loose. Got a little tight there at the end. The long stop, Kelly. Daniel Suarez also started off a little bit loose, said he was good through the middle of the run, got loose again, but asked for no adjustments, did want, not want to be tightened up. Not what Eric Jones was hoping for. Not only did they have a slow stop, but he also killed it coming off of pit road. You can't make mistakes and hope to advance to the championship four. You could win one of the cars we race. Go to NASCAR.com slash Chase promo now and enter for a chance to win a new Chevy, Ford, or Toyota. Welcome back to Ticket Galaxy 200. And we mentioned you can't make mistakes, especially on pit road. That's what happened here with the 20 of Eric Jones. Marty. And you guys can see he came in, slid through the stall. They got back to uh, back the car up. But when he backed the car up, he's actually on the hose of rear tire changer Mike Hicks. And Hicks told me he had about five inches of toes left, and he wouldn't have been able to change that left rear tire for that 20 car. So he came in running second and then stalled it, leaving pit road out 17th. So the interesting part about this, Jeff and Steve, is Will they have a bad restart here? Will starting so far back in the pack affect them moving forward from here? But that's what we started the show with talking about. Can this 20 team have a clean race start to finish a problem here in a cut race at Phoenix? How big is that? Well, he's only two points above the cut line now. Let's listen into the radio. All right, Eric. Big picture, we're still good, but it's close. Put ourselves a little bit of hole here, so you're going to have to let it hang out a little bit. Do that race car driving thing. Instinct. 
all about instinct. Huh? Do that race car driver thing. Well, they're talking about instincts. You know, you heard him say instincts. That means be who you are, but they're afraid to do be who they are because right. they're afraid they're going to get into an accident. But you know, at some point, you have to be the driver that you are. Three on the outside is Ty Dillon. Out in front of the field now is Kyle Busch. Let him have the outside line. And Ty Dillon has the lead now. Did a two-tire stop, and that enabled him to get out in front of the 18. So it's Ty Dillon, Kyle Busch, and Austin Dillon, the top three. And hearing the restart is under review by NASCAR. Side by side for the lead. On the inside, Kyle Busch trying to get back out front. He does. At the halfway point, 100 laps complete, 100 to go. And now Austin Dillon has passed younger brother Ty Dillon for second. The Dillon brothers fight. We think about Eric Jones. We mentioned all the way back on that restart when he's already up to the 15th position, but he has to take his. You don't want to say take his time, but he does have to take his time. He can't force himself into a mistake. So you see him right there. He kind of has a little bit of a pocket. Luckily, the cars in front of him are single file, Jeff. He can kind of pick them off one at a time. Yeah, I think that's what he, you know, typically they have a fast enough car. You can see the DC solar car in front is loose. The car was moving around a lot. Now he's going to go to the very bottom of the racetrack, cut that corner, try to gain the spot on the 48. This is where you have to be careful. Right here where you get in the corner, you got all four tires below that line. Try not to let the car get loose and go up the racetrack and get to the side of Brendan Bull. Marty. Hey, guys, you know, we, we heard Chris Gavehart mention instincts a moment ago, and Jeff, you touched on it. Remember that wreck at Kentucky, very first race of the chase for Eric Jones. He kind of felt like he was being too aggressive, and the team kind of said, listen, you're being too aggressive in that race. Jeff, I know you feel a little differently about that, but ever since then, Chris Gavehart told me he's run 90% of the laps, speaking of Eric Jones, at 90% or less since then, kind of backing it down, reining it in a little bit, and he'll let him go next week at Homestead Miami if they have a shot to win the championship. But here you go, talking about instincts, do you be aggressive here or do you be conservative trying to come up through the field? Yeah, Marty, the thing I think about that wreck at Kentucky, although it was weeks ago, yes, he goes too aggressive in the wreck that he got in, as you see him making the move on the 48. But prior to that, he wasn't as aggressive as you typically see him. And so that kept moving him back in the field on restarts. But Brendan Poole with a big bout and a little bit of contact, and that's where it's hard. That's where you want to just drive that car off the corner, be in the throttle, lean on Brendan Poole, but he's afraid to do it. Now he's got the bumper to it. And I'm not sure that's a wise idea. I was getting ready to say. I mean, you know, Brendan, to get the championship here. Well, Brendan Poole has every right to run that outside in three and four. And I know Eric Jones isn't happy, but Brendan Poole, what is he doing wrong? I, I don't think the 20 does any sort of bumper on him at all. The 07. It's Ray Black Jr. that has stopped on the track and brought out the caution. This is the fourth caution. What I mean, that was aggressive driving there by Eric Jones. Just past the halfway right, point, he's got to think about how close he is to making it into the championship four. That's what we're talking about. What's the right thing to do? Do you drive the way you always drive, or do you, or you try to be conservative? And it's a difficult decision for these drivers to make. I say you drive the way you normally drive. I believe right, you have to in there. go and give everything you can give, because who says you're not going to have a bad pit stop? Who says something else isn't going to happen? I think you need to be smart, but aggressive. Right. Another tire failure, don't you think? Yeah, that's a Ooh, big hit. That's a heavy angle to hit at. You wouldn't think that was brake heat, though. We hadn't run long enough that run for brake heat to cause that. No, but these restarts are so crazy. You know, we have to go back and see perhaps if there was contact or something that caused the tire to go down. Steve, one of the things that's interesting now with these cautions again, and pit road is open, they only have four sets of tires for this race. Yeah, and, you know, it doesn't seem like tires are worth a whole lot, but there's 20 of Eric Jones. Perhaps it wants to make adjustments. You know, it's one thing to run out front, but when you get in the back, your car drives much different. Dave? And so, coming down pit road is Brendan gone. He will not take any more of his tires right now. He just will top off for fuel, trying to stay off strategy, Marty. Chris Capehart making the call here. Eric Jones said, I'm way loose in traffic. I just can't do anything. So in order to get through the traffic, obviously your car handles way different back there. They're going to make a chassis adjustment, trying to tighten up this 20 car, hoping he can make his way back up through the field and to the top of the charts. 94 laps to go in the desert. And maybe Brendan Gaughan might try not coming back to pit road ever again. We go NASCAR nonstop.
the dog leg here is pretty tricky ever since they repaved it. Dog leg at Phoenix is intense. It is definitely a unique corner in our sport. It's easy by yourself, but when you get to running two and three wide, decisions have to be made, especially getting into turn three. It is definitely like being on a roller coaster. Your helmet bangs side to side in your head brace, so you give yourself a headache all day. You hit it, splitter of your race car very hard every time that you, you do that. You hit it, you watch yourself start catching all those guys, you come back on the racetrack and clack, clack, and then you hit the corner and hope you made it. Welcome back to Phoenix International Raceway. Definitely a unique dog leg on the back stretch, and I really enjoy Brendan Gaughan's description of what it's like going through the dog leg when you don't stay on the racetrack. Made my head hurt. <laughs> clack, clack. <laughs> Spotter coverage. Brought to you by Liberty Mutual Insurance, helping drivers worry less on the track and on the road. Again, a unique place for the spotters. They are up in turn one. And how difficult will it be for these spotters to help the 20 of Eric Jones move forward and try to get back in a position to where He's inside the top four because right now he's three points outside of the top four in points. Well, they pitted under this last caution from 14th. They're going to restart back at 22nd. They've made this, you know, more difficult. I understand that they're closer to a fuel window, and I'm assuming that's what the decision was to come to make some adjustments and top off the fuel as we see Brandon Gaughan peel off in front of the 20 and the 33 of Brandon Jones. I think they're coming to pit road for more fuel. But Eric Jones, uh, excuse me, Eric Jones right here, he's just going to have to have a clean restart. Take a deep breath. We can't, I mean, he's putting the bumper to the 48. And, Dave, we see the 62 back on pit road just for some more fuel. Steve, Rick mentioned as we were going to break that Brandon, Brendan might not return to pit road. Well, he returned a couple more times now because they're still not close enough on their fuel window. This puts him about eight laps short, according to the crew, talking to the driver over the radio. What they might do, Steve, let me bend your strategy ear on this just a little bit. They said that even if we would pit coming to the green and go a lap down, that might even work out for us as well. How would that work out? That's really aggressive. I'm not sure yeah. I would want to do that. I think uh, you would want to just hope you get enough cautions. I, I would just try to save eight laps of fuel. I would, if you're going to play this strategy trying to get a win, I think you're just going to it saying, okay, it's going to go green the rest of the way. You have to save eight laps. Right. Start doing it right now. If it doesn't work out, so what? You're, trying to, you're trying to win a race. And, Rick, you know, Kyle Busch has put together an impressive race. I don't think probably shocking anyone. He's so good here. But he needs to be careful, although he has led 102 laps. Brad Kozlowski in this 22 car, we haven't talked much about him because he started last for unapproved adjustments. But slowly and methodically worked his way up, currently in the eighth position. And, and we talk about this, Jeff. We don't really know what the 22 has until he gets a little clean air, Kelly. Perhaps he gets up in the top four or five. He might something to challenge Kyle Busch. Yeah, and overall, he's really been pretty happy with the balance of his race car. At one point, they had pulled a little bit too much tape, so he thought he lost some speed, but that should have been corrected the last time down pit road. It's just hard to imagine this 22 team still looking for its first win of the season for Team Penske and the crew chief, Greg Irwin, telling me they need that win badly. They think about it every day. And on top of that, on top of wanting to get to victory lane, this is a team still fighting in the owner's championship. So they're trying to punch their ticket to Miami to be one of the four teams to compete for that championship. Yeah, and we, we heard Brendan gone. They were eight laps short. Well, NASCAR added a lap before they went to green. So the 62 came back to pit road with the 33 of Brandon Jones. So now they're seven laps short. So they bought themselves another lap. We'll see if that strategy plays out. That would mean that you pretty much have to go green flag from here on out because if it is a caution and guys are able to come down and get tires, that will be a huge advantage uh, over Brendan Gaughan if he stays out on the racetrack. Green flag back in the air. The start by Austin Dillon. Let's see if he can hang with him on the outside. Way up the racetrack came the seven of Justin Allgaier and close racing there for seven of Allgaier with the six of Daryl Wallace Jr. Now as there's just 88 laps to go in this race, everyone's going to be fighting for every inch on this racetrack. We see Ricky Stenhouse Jr. in the 60 on the inside of the 98. Got a glimpse of Eric Jones in that green car. I mean, he is right back there in the middle of that mess. What a move there by Ricky Stenhouse Jr. It worked going 
through the dog leg. Ray Black Jr. was treated and released from the infield care center. We watched Daniel Suarez in the 19. And look at the points right there on that last lap by Eric Jones and Blake Cook tied. Ryan Reed only one point behind those two cars. The 19, the 1, the 7, and the 20. Currently in the top four in points. Justin Allgaier has been consistently running about fifth, now in the sixth spot behind Darrell Wallace Jr. There's Eric Jones running a little bit higher line, and Jones making his way up. He's currently up into the 16th position now. That move moved him back into the top four. So with that pass, that pushes Blake Cook down one spot away from a championship four position. Battle for six on the right side of your screen. Ryan Reed in the 16 and Justin Augar in the seven. And it's side by side now. Eric Jones looks like he's going to be passed by Justin Marks. Marks making that outside line work. And a combination of Eric trying to be patient, trying not to push the issue. Maybe some communication to Eric Jones to calm down, cooler heads prevail. Make sure that you get into position so that we have a chance to run for a championship. Mike. Well, one guy who wants to be in position to run for that championship would be Blake Cook. He knew coming in he needed to run inside the top five. However, despite starting there, he's faded. He's back to 10th right now because of a tight race car. Uh, his crew chief, Chris Rice, a very colorful guy, as we've all begun to learn throughout the course of the year, gave him a little bit of pep talk just recently. Tell him, hey, look, Blake, we need a touchdown this race. We need, we need a win, and all we need is a field goal in Homestead, and we'll walk away with a big trophy. This team has always been very football-minded. After all, the owner of this team, Matt Collick, was a former college quarterback at Akron. Hey, let's listen into the 11 radio. Could be an issue for Blake Cook. Hole in the front end. Yeah, you can see it right there in the lower grill screen. It's kind of a perforated aluminum sheet, so there's already some holes, but there's one maybe the size of, like they mentioned, a baseball. So I don't think the hole is a big issue. You're going to let air through there anyway. The question is, where is that piece? What damage has it done? The right behind that is the radiator. So if it's gone in and it's in the ductwork, riding around, bouncing around, it can continue to damage the radiator. It may have more long-term effects. We want to keep his eye on temperature gauge. Kyle Busch out in front of Austin Dillon, Daniel Suarez, Daryl Wallace Jr., and Ty Dillon. And the documented Ty Dillon took just two tires on the last pit stop cycle where the leaders were on pit road. And he gained some track position through that gamble, but definitely not as good as four tires. And now Justin Allgaier, Ryan Reed, Ricky Stenhouse trying to move inside the three here. So Kyle Busch is going to get the title of leading the most laps. Of course, Kyle Busch doesn't get points uh, because he runs full-time in the Sprint Cup Series. At the beginning of the year, you have to choose which series you want to race for points. Kyle Busch racing for a championship potentially tomorrow. Uh, trying to get into the championship four in the Sprint Cup Series. So he doesn't get the points, the bonus points that all of the other drivers are searching for. As we continue to watch the eight drivers that are fighting for the four spots. We'll get some chase updates. We start with Kelly. And Daniel Suarez, who's in position for a seventh straight top five finish. This is a driver that always seems to have a smile on his face. And when asked about how he's been able to handle the pressure of this chase so well, he really credits his past growing up in Mexico racing. He said that his family didn't have a lot of money, so he always had to race well to get a sponsor just to compete in the next race. So he says that's really helped him throughout his entire career. I talk about those top five finishes while well, his crew chief, Scott Graves, says they've still got to break through to the next level, though. They feel like going to Miami, it's going to take a race win to come away with this championship, Mike. 
Hamilton's going to take a race win tonight for Daryl Wallace to even be championship eligible next week. He knew that coming into this race. So did the team. So much, in fact, they came with a bit of an experimental setup this week just to see if they could hit on something. And guess what? They felt like they did. During practice yesterday, they told me it's the best race car they've had all year long. Right now, Wallace saying it's just a little bit free, having a little bit of trouble getting back to the gas, but otherwise pretty good, Dave. Mike, as you look at the chase points on the left, Justin Allgaier is doing what he needs to do. And when I spoke with him on Friday morning, he was very comfortable with the place that this team is right now. And he said, when I looked at the chase format and I looked at the races in every round, Phoenix was one place where I thought I could make something happen for sure. Well, making something happen is at least doing exactly what he's doing right now, Marty. Dave Phil Gold, the crew chief for Ryan Reed, called this opportunity to go win a championship, a golden opportunity, but also a nerve-wracking one. So far, as driver doing his part, running in the top five, now running seventh. They've had a very nice race. In fact, maybe their best race in recent memory. He said, I've got to roll three and four better, but one and two is pretty good. His teammate right behind him, and right now, Ryan Reed, agonizingly Rick five points out of that cut line he can see those spots in front of him he just can't pass those cars problem everyone's so tight the points so close and Kyle Busch it's not been close for him he's got two seconds lead over Austin Dillon's listen into his radio our count for us to make it we'd have to lift a football field leak into both corners the entire stand ain't that like three quarters of the straightaway Exactly, and I'm being a little uh, cautious. It's more like 400 feet, not 300. Sure, my Penn State math is close. Yeah, that's why he can play around, just hang on to the lead. I just don't think we can save that much. So there you have it. They're already looking at it. This continues to go green. They don't think they'll be able to make it all the way. And again, the strategy that the 62 team is playing, they want to be able to make it all the way. So they're, they were actually on pit road when everyone was two by two waiting for the green flag to come out. Well, not just the 62. Eric Jones has 11 laps more fuel than Kyle Busch in the 13th position. So he has to be in a much better position, although not as good as the 62. The 62, the gamble is pretty easy. If you're Eric Jones, I'm not sure that gamble is worth it. If, if the cars you're racing for points hit pit road, you just come in, put the fuel in the car, and race to race another day in Miami. Dave. And Shane Wilson told his driver just before they went green, with 30 or 40 to go, that's when we'll ask you to back her way down and see if we can make this work. Yeah, so it really, what it really boils down to the 18 strategy. If you can't make it, then go 100%. Catch the 62, catch the 33, put them a lap down, make it where maybe they can't go back around and catch you. So if I'm the crew chief of the 18, and I know that I don't, you know, I'm not in points, I'm telling my driver to go get you some, go as hard as you can to try to get in front of the 62 and the 33. 69 laps to go. The longest green flag run today has been 49 laps. We'll see if anyone can go that far. We go NASCAR nonstop.
NASCAR on NBCSN is brought to you by Toyota. Let's go places. And by Credit One Bank, the official credit card of NASCAR. Caution has come out. It's for the fifth time, and this is for Brendan Gone, and he hit the wall a ton. And on his radio, we were actually listening in. He said that one hurt. He had a lot of time to anticipate hitting the wall. Right front tire went down. Good to see him climb out of that car. I'm sure he'll be disappointed, though. They were gambling. They were trying to figure out how they could make it. How they could get into the championship four. They knew it was going to have to take a win. As we look at the replay. See, so he's already up the racetrack and sparks coming out from underneath it. You know, we heard about them coming back and putting tape on the brake ducts. You know, taping them off more. You have to wonder if that heat, if right. having them taped off more, if that heat didn't transfer into the wheel and melt the beat. Let's listen in. This was the radio just moments ago for the 62. You okay? Yeah, that just was mentally grueling. I had about four seconds to think about how bad that was going to hurt. And that was, he was in turn one. And we've got guys on pit road. Mike? Darrell Wallace is among them pitting from the fourth spot, saying the car had been getting progressively tighter late center off the exit of three and four. Going to make a four tire change, also a track bar adjustment and an air pressure adjustment on the six, Dave. Free in tight center for the seven car of Justin Allgaier. He had fallen back to sixth place, Marty. Phil Go, the crew chief for Ryan Reed, said if we do what everybody else does here, it's not going to get us where we need to be. We have everything to gain and nothing to lose. So there you see it, a two-tire stop trying to get the lead, Kelly. Daniel Suarez is also two tires. He fired off way too loose, and while his center tightened up, he was still loose on entry and exit. And you see the spots picked up. Kyle Busch holds on to the lead, but a lot of two-tire stops.
NASCAR Xfinity Series will crown a champion next Saturday in Homestead, Miami. Race coverage is on NBCSN starting at 3 p.m. Eastern. I want to take a look at the Toyota driver updates as we look at Eric Jones and what he has to do. Right now, the scoring monitor has him in the eighth position out front. It's Kyle Busch, Daniel Suarez running second. Want to listen into a little radio? Yeah, so two things there. It's all good, but with that few laps, I definitely wasn't going to take four. And uh, Lambert didn't hear me on two to tell you not to slide him. Temporal, I'm just waiting. You know, I'm going to assume we're taking four unless something else is said. Yeah, I get it. It's all good. We only had 20 laps on our tires at Phoenix. You're not going to take four right there, but all good. Restart eight. So, Jeff, you know, we were talking. It just seems like this 20 car is just one step behind on, on the details. So, right here, the 20 comes in. He stops. Hits right on the sign. Pick crew goes to work. Everything looks good. They change the right side tires. The tire changer clears. They drop the jack. He doesn't have any gear. He doesn't have any gear because he wasn't told, hey, we're taking two tires. And it's not a huge thing, but those details matter, Marty. Those two to three seconds matter, don't they, Steve? And it feels like an attorney, too, when you're a pit crew member, and they had to tell them to go, obviously, because they lack that communication. But obviously, if they're going to win a championship next week, then he gets things buttoned up here on the 20 car, obviously, with him sliding through the pits earlier and this mis miscommunication on this two-tire stop. Yeah, I mean, listen, when he said don't slide them, that means, you know, you're doing two. But the driver's got to be told definitively because the driver has a lot of things going on. It's been tense. It's been a lot of nerves. There's been a lot of things going on was out of the chase a little while ago, has worked himself back in, coming down pit road, pit road speed. You just have to be told two tires, two tires, and then you get in your head when it drag, you know, you've got to have it in first gear when before the car stops is what you got to do. But all those things need to be communicated to the driver. Well, and here's why. Those two or three seconds take a car that took two tires and lost some of the advantage in front of, not behind, in front of Eric Jones is Austin Dillon on four fresh tires. We talk about the points and how important it is. Eric Jones is only plus five currently. You see right here. Well, let's look behind Eric Jones. Darrell Wallace Jr., four tires. Ty Dillon, four tires. Brennan Poole, four tires. Ricky Stenhouse Jr., four tires. Elliot Salad, four tires. My point is, Eric Jones has a good car, but they continue to put themselves at a handicap. Now they've given a very talented driver and a very good car only two tires with four tires lined up behind them. And, and to be honest, it has happened consistently. This, this team has the fastest car week in and week out, but they keep finding themselves in this position where they have to dig themselves out of a hole. Jeff, I think you, you hit the nail right on the head with the pressure situation. This is the first time this chase format has been in for the Xfinity Series. Now, a year ago, Eric Jones won the championship in the Xfinity Series, so he's a defending series champion, but that was a different format. Now there's the pressure of win and advance, and it's three races at a time. And they have struggled to put three races together to make sure that they could comfortably advance. Coming in to this chase, Eric Jones was the favorite. Four wins on the season. Everyone thought Eric Jones should be able to dominate this chase. But as we look at the point standings, Eric Jones is still hovering right around the maybe or maybe not make it into the championship four. Just 56 laps to go from Phoenix. And let's look back on what's taken place with Blake Cook and Justin Allgaier, those two fighting for position. And Blake Cook trying to get by the 16 of Ryan Reed. Fell behind early. The car of Eric Jones comes in the pits, slides through his pits, then has to back up to let the service get done. So he came in running second right here, came out running 17. Yeah, that's really where the problem started for the 20 and another chase competitor with the 20 is the 62 of Brendan gone working some fuel strategy trying to do anything to give themselves a chance had a flat tire heavy contact in the wall Dave he's uh, just watched the uh, highlights from the race and I told him he wasn't gonna like the last one that was a big hit you okay yeah it just uh that sucker blew like way on the straightaway man I swear I checked my watch twice before it hit the wall saying this is gonna suck and I said that three times um, man South Point Chevy it was good if it does, if it stays green, it worked out like Shane and I wanted. We pitted, we had just enough fuel if I saved a little, and uh, unfortunately, we were the caution. So, hey, we took a shot at it, we took a big swing, and and you know that's I can't ask for anything more. Shane Wilson will dig. I'll, I'll live and die with him, man. He takes always takes care of me. 
Your round of eight was marred by the Kansas finish and then uh, penalty last week. But how will you remember this chase, Brendan? Because it's been fun to watch it. It's been fun to do. You know, I, I wish we would have had a better second round, you know, of chase races. But uh, we'll come back next year and, and try to do what we did in the first round through all three. The good news is he's coming back. Just heard it right here, Rick. Absolutely. And a smile on his face. I mean, it was a hard hit. And I'm sure disappointed, but Brendan Gaughan always has a very positive outlook, especially when it comes to racing. Great attitude, fun guy to be around. Even a huge disappointment, still smiling and having a good time. Two by two, they're lined up behind Kyle Busch and Daniel Suarez. Most laps led in a season, Kyle Busch. Already at 2,000. Look at how many times his name is on this list with Sam Hart. Sam Hart, one of the, le the legends of our sport. Unbelievable race car driver. Kyle asked on the radio which lane the 19 wanted. Those are teammates from Joe Gibbs Racing. So Kyle Busch acknowledging Daniel Suarez up front with him as they get ready to re-enter the restart zone. Really didn't matter which lane Daniel Suarez wanted as Kyle Busch shoots out to the lead. Justin Allgaier with a great restart moves up into the second spot. Can he hang on to it? Here comes Daniel Suarez looking to the inside. Oh, into the wall hard, the six of Darrell Wallace Jr. And they pile up behind him. Big impact. We can hear that in the booth. Caution has come out and there is not a lot of room on the front stretch as two cars have stopped on the front stretch so I'm not sure if they will bring the cars onto pit road or if they're going to stop them. You see Darrell Wallace Jr. giving a thumbs up as he climbed out of that car. And they are going to stop the field in turn four just because not a lot of room. They want to make sure they get to these drivers and check to make sure that they're safe. Yeah, Darrell Walsh Jr., you know, in that must-win situation, had four tires on. Very aggressive on the restart. He caught my attention on the back stretch. He was at the bottom of the dogleg, taking Eric Jones three wide. Completed that pass, I thought, as he went into turn three. You know, you know and I, I applaud him. I mean, we talk about... With your back against the wall, you have to make something happen. He was attempting to make something happen here with 52 to go at Phoenix. It was, you know, time to go. So right here, this is on the restart exiting turn two. And you see he hangs a left, gets below the two and the 20, then shortcuts the back stretch, does a nice job, clears both these cars getting into turn three, I thought. He's got the 11 up in front of him the radio we heard him say tell the 11 thanks and 11 came down on it yeah I mean, the 11 takes a left to try to pass the 22 I'm, I'm sure he didn't mean to hit the six but simply he's the cause and this will, this will show it clear as day the six is inside clear. the 11 clear clear the 11 he's turns coming. left trying to get a caution 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 that is a hard shot yeah it's pretty clear right there the Blake Cook had a run off to turn four and didn't check his mirror, didn't didn't so, know he was there, and just turned left. And Darrell Wallace did nothing wrong whatsoever. So we talked morning night too. They ran really well. They did, and, and Jeff, but we talked about this. Where the spotters are located here, these cars are coming directly at them. So I'm not sure if there's a depth perception issue. Like coming at them, the spotter knows the six is inside the eleven as far as right to left but where front to back like just because he's a lane below doesn't mean he's to the rear bumper so you have to ask yourself what information did the 11 have obviously he thought he was clear or thought that the six could move so let's listen in to the 11 radio behind the 22 didn't know the six was there tell them that Temple. Yeah, he was behind the 22, didn't know that six was there. You saw the 11 make an aggressive move to the left, trying to get by the 22. 
you know, I, th- I think that's that's all part of Blake Cook's situation too, right? He has a sense of urgency. He's trying to push the issue a little bit. That's a wreck that is probably caused by Blake knowing the situation he's in, knowing he's got to get some spots, and making a move before really checking to make sure that the lane was clear. I got to pee. <laughs> and then there's so that. There's, <laughs> there's two drivers that were in a must-win situation, and both of those drivers have just wrecked. The 62 got into the wall, is off the track, out of the race, and now the six of Darrell Wallace Jr. was in a must-win situation, also Rex on the front stretch, and he is out of this race. So now for the four spots, there are six drivers fighting for those opportunities to run for a championship at Miami. Tomorrow, Sprint Cup Chase Elimination Race. That coverage on NBC begins at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll find out who will join Jimmy Johnson and Carl Edwards in the championship four. Again, drivers fighting to be in the championship four for the Xfinity Series. And two have been eliminated. See Eric Jones, Justin Allgaier, currently third and fourth. They're in. The two that are out, Blake Cook and Ryan Reed. And you look at it, six points. That's six places on the racetrack, just six positions. And earlier I mentioned Eric Jones winning the championship last year. He won it in the truck series last year. So he's trying to win the championship now in the Xfinity series. Chris Buescher actually won the Xfinity series championship last year. Want to chat with Justin Allgaier, currently fourth in the point standings, Jeff. Hey, Justin, it's Jeff, NBCSN booth. You with us? Hey, got you, Jeff. Loud and clear. Well, you guys have done everything that you need to do so far. How's it going inside the car? Well, it's going good. You know, we've got a great solid in Chevy. And Jason Redhead and these seven team guys have done an awesome job. And, you know, everybody's doing most for us really wants to have two cars in this chase, and we're trying to do everything we can to, to make that happen tonight. Well, you sure sound calm. Are you, are you as calm as you sound? I think so. You know, uh, our ultimate goal is to come here and win the race and give it 100 percent and whatever the finish is, it is. And if that puts us in the next round, then that's what we have to do. And if it doesn't, 
So, you know, we've left it all on the table tonight. We've, we've done everything we can possibly do from being down here in the car to the guys down in the pit. So, you know, if you give it 100, 100% uh, all night long and it works in your favor, then you've done your job. And if not, uh, you did everything you could do. Well, thank you for uh, talking to us and good luck the rest of the night. Absolutely, Jeff. Thank you, buddy. And with Darrell Wallace Jr., who just got out at the infield care center, let's go to Mike. And you can see the look of dejection on his face. Uh, he told me he was okay. You're okay. Uh, that's good to hear. It was an awfully hard hit. Uh, we heard you make comments about the 11. What transpired out there on the racetrack? My grandmother was giving me the ride of my life. That was the most fun I've ever had all year. And just circumstances took us out. So it's just hard. Thanks, Granny. I love you. But going to Homestead and let her ride again. Uh, obviously, uh, quite an emotional day for you, Bubba. Your grandmother, her name above the door on the car, you, you had said it felt like she was driving the car at times. Uh, to that point, it, it certainly seemed like you had a very good race car. How would you describe the night? And, and as you reflect back on this chase, what will you take from it? Just thanks to my team for giving me the best race car all year long. Um, just sucks, man. Granny was going up to win that thing on that restart. We were moving. It was probably the sexiest restart we've ever had. And uh, just had it taken away from us. About like what happened with her. And you know, everything was so good. And the next thing you know, we, we, she's gone from us. So, um, man, it was it was a long shot to get in the chase. But to, uh, to, to, to just have a good race and ha get a good finish, we need one. We've had the, the, the shittiest luck so long this year. And it's just so hard. So, um, just... I can't thank my granny enough for giving me that ride because it was fun. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mike. Rick? Yeah, it's been an emotional day, an emotional couple days, obviously, for Darrell Wallace Jr. Uh, the start of the race, Randy Jan, they put that on the car uh, yesterday. And you see just how much he was thinking about family before the start of this race dedicating the race to his grandmother who passed away and then for it to end the way it did so a difficult night for Darrell Wallace Jr. I apologize for the language there but obviously uh, this is a, an emotional time and a, a difficult situation for him thinking he had an opportunity had a had a possibility of making the move he knew he had to win and he felt like he could. That was the thing. He had confidence. Well, when you, you I mean you look at obviously what his grandmother meant, what this week has been for him, the trying situation, the, just the emotion of it. But then to put all of that in a place where he can get in the race car and focus and drive, and he really, in, in this six car had more speed and was more competitive tonight than we've seen in a long, long time. All year, and, and, really. And and you know he wasn't. There wasn't emotion talking when he said he was going up to win that race. That was reality talking. He had some moves. He had four tires. I mean, he caught my attention on the restart. It's unfortunate to end this way uh, because it really was shaping up to be an, an amazing night for Darrell Wallace Jr. and that whole six car. And, and that makes it worse, right? I mean, when you're running poorly and you get into a wreck, it's, you know, it's disappointing, but not nearly as bad. When you add everything that's going on with him this week, with this chase means getting into it and then having a good race car, perhaps the best race car in a long time, and then get wrecked, it just all adds up. So a tough night for Brendan Gaughan, a tough night now for Darrell Wallace Jr. But there are still 51 laps to go. The cars have refired. They're rolling once again under a caution. It's the sixth caution of the night. There are, as I mentioned, 51 laps to go. Some drivers are going to be trying to save some fuel. Chase standings as they run. Daniel Suarez, 19 points above the line. Elliott Sadler, just eight. Eric Jones, six. Justin Allgaier, only three points above the line. Take a listen to the 18 radio. He wants to know what's going on with the chase standings. Your chase break update. Eric's in by six points. Big Cook's out by three. Ryan Reed's out by six. Justin Allgaier is currently in by three. And then the 19 and the one have both clinched, as long as they run better than 15.
So there you have it, Kyle Busch. Although it, it won't mean anything to him as far as the race win, but he is looking out for the 19 of Daniel Suarez, a teammate of his. And Suarez currently running in the third position, wanting to know how he's doing, as well as Eric Jones in the 20. Yeah, and how about the seven of Justin Allgaier? You know, it seems like he hasn't been able to put that run together to kind of put an exclamation point on his chase tonight. He's doing it in the second position. And how cool to talk to us under that red. I mean, in the in the playoffs, in the battle to get his keep his season alive, his championship hopes alive, and he it sounded remarkably he's out of way. Yeah. yeah. And Justin Algar, what an incredible story Justin Algar is. He drove for his family's team in the ARCA Racing Series, the last race of the season in 2003 and he is excuse me 2008 he's running for the championship but he's currently third entering the final race it ends up the guys running one and two wreck each other in that race he ends up winning the championship in 2008 a huge accomplishment for the family, a huge accomplishment for Justin Allgaier. He goes on the very next year to be the Rookie of the Year in the Xfinity Series in 2009. He's already accumulated three wins in the Xfinity Series and now on the cusp of making it into the Championship Four with a chance for a title in the Xfinity Series. Now with 49 to go, these restarts have just been... You know, the front stretch is very, very difficult to get the power down and get accelerating. But then if you get that figured out and you get through turns one and two, then you come to this very unique back stretch. This dog leg, Jeff, gives the drivers the option to hang a left. You see the sparks fly off Elliott Sadler and go straight short of the back stretch. Yeah, way down on the inside of the racetrack. And the problem is that's easy. It's getting back in onto the racetrack and finding your way into turn three without, you know, drifting up into the car on the outside of you. We've yeah, seen bottom some, it is. Yeah. Cars bottom out. Some interesting restarts and about to see another one. Under 50 laps to go, 49. When they come by this time, it'll be 48 and remaining. It, it's not just the dog leg. This front stretch, how many times? What is it about Phoenix? So many cars stack up here on the start. You can't see. Everybody's in a straight line. And, you know, if you imagine being on the interstate, two cars in front of you, Two cars, you know, in front of those guys. You can't see the cars that are in front. So it's the same thing here. You're side by side, cannot see. You're trying to anticipate when the leaders go. You're in row six, row seven. You can't see when the leaders go. So it's hard to know when to go. You judge it wrong. You start to accelerate. You have to slow down. Then the guy behind you went when you went. Now it just is a stack up. What? Well, that's my concern for the one of Elliott Sadler. Well, he hasn't had the best night, but doing what he needs to do. Still eight points, but way back in 13th. In the seventh row, and, and while that's enough, one stack up, one bumper bar through the radiator, and his championship hopes are over. So, I mean, we just saw how easily it can happen to Darrell Wallace Jr. He was running up front and, and basically got an accident done of his own doing. That one needs to try to avoid any situation like that. Two by two, Kyle Busch, Justin Allgaier making up row one. Kyle Busch has chosen the inside line. Allgaier will be on the outside. They come back into the restart zone. Green flag back in the air. Great run through one and two. Can all guy clear him? Kyle Bush battles back on the inside. They stay side by side, coming out of four. Algar in front of Kyle Busch. That was an impressive move. Now, oh, now how aggressive will the 18 be? And just that quickly, the 18 back in front of the seven. Now the seven battling back to the inside. Here comes the 19 of Daniel Suarez. Seven car, he wanted the bottom of the racetrack in turn one. Kyle Busch, he also wanted it. A little bit of contact. Right now, Algar's got to remain calm, though. He has to focus on the goal. The goal is moving forward. Don't let the emotions of that contact take the race over. And remember when we talked to him, 
He sounded very calm, but I'm not so sure you can be calm after somebody puts the bumper to you when you're running for a championship. See right here, the 18 goes to go underneath him, and the 7 car wants that bottom and a little bit of contact from the 18. So I'm sure Al is not happy about that, but like I said, he's got to keep the big picture in mind. So it's Kyle Busch, Justin Allgaier, Daniel Suarez, Ryan Reed, and Austin Dillon. They're the top five. Blake Cook has moved up into the sixth position. Brad Keselowski, Brennan Poole, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., Ty Dillon, the top ten. Just outside the top ten, Eric Jones in 11. And I'm telling you, I'm a little concerned about Eric Jones. We mentioned he's on two tires. A lot of other cars took four tires around him. He's actually fallen back a little bit. And as you see Blake Cook and Justin Allgaier move up, look at the points. The 20 car is only two points in at the moment. Two points, two positions. A little bit of a bobble there for the three of Ty Dillon. Eric Jones holding on to that 11 spot. Marty. And Ricky's lost four spots since this restart. And you're right, Steve. You look at those points. A moment ago, he was clearly having a lot of cushion. Now just two points in those spots behind him. The guys back there all have four tires as well. So a little bit of concern in the 20 camp. Nothing on the radio so far, but already four spots lost since the restart. Yeah, what they've got to hope, though, is that those four tires can march up and get the 11 car. If, you know, the, the cars, you know, because the 11, it's uh, he's also on two tires. So that right there is, is a positive. But he can't ride. He cannot just sit back here and ride. I think he has to try to advance his position. He's trying to get by Brennan Poole. Again, that would be a position. That would be a point. Well, and you see the last time all the leaders were on pit road was at 139. That's the same for everyone. But look at the mix of tires. The leaders are all on two tires. But Austin Dillon back there in fifth has four tires. That 60 of Ricky Stenhouse Jr., we haven't heard a lot of him. But he's using those four tires moving through the field. You get a couple cautions. And next thing you know, those four good year tires are going to pay off. Right along with Brennan Poole. The chase points on the left side of the screen. As they run, the 19, the 1, the 7, and the 20 could be racing for a championship next weekend. One thing, keep in mind, one thing to keep in mind, Ryan Reed's in there running fourth. Yeah. I mean, what if something happened on restarts and Ryan Reed goes up and wins this race? Well, now three points of the good doesn't get it done any longer. Right. It pushes you out. So I know Ryan Reed is not in position to win this race at the moment, but we've seen how crazy restarts get and anything can happen. We continue to mention win the race. If you want to win this race, you're going to have to get by Kyle Busch. He has led 152 and counting of the laps tonight, and he continues to run out front.
a fight for the ninth position. We wonder how aggressive the 20 will be. Eric Jones trying to get by Ty Dillon. Now, there is a history here between these two. On a restart, the three and the 20 were fighting for the lead at Kentucky, and the 20 drifted up the racetrack, collected the three, took both of them out at Kentucky. How aggressive will he be now as he looks to the inside? Yeah, really, at this point, I think if you're Eric Jones in this 20 team, you have to ask yourself, do you need these points? You're plus three at the moment. Um, Why Blake Cook still has points available in front of him, he doesn't seem like he can advance and get past Austin Dillon. Um, sometimes patience goes a long ways, and, and I think this might be one of the times that the 20, if, if the three bobbles, Jeff, he could go by, but I'm not sure he wants to get in a position where him and the three need the same piece of real estate. Well, I, I think you're right. It's primarily because the 11 of Blake, Blake Cook, he can see. He's not that far in front of him, and Blake is under serious pressure from Ricky Stenhouse Jr., so I think with that being the equation, that matters too. And around goes the 60, past the 11 of Blake Cook. So Ricky Stenhouse Jr. makes the pass on Blake Cook, and what that does is it moves one more position back for Blake Cook. That means it's four points now that separate Blake Cook from a spot in the championship four. And it will have to be, because Blake Cook going the wrong direction, it will have to be Eric Jones also backing up and losing four spots if Blake Cook wants to have a shot to get into that championship hunt. Brad Kozlowski in the 22 after starting at the back because of unapproved adjustments has caught up to the back bumper of the 11 of Blake Cook and now Kozlowski running eight. Really the 22 kind of like it's been all year. It's just not that winning car that we're used to seeing out of the, the Penske camp and I thought when we saw him move up from starting in the rear, as you mentioned, he got, gained a lot of time, you know, ground quickly. I thought tonight they were going to show a little bit more competitiveness. With under 28 laps to go, let's get some chase updates. We start with Justin Allgaier and Dave Burns. Rick, on that last pit stop, they took on two right side tires, but they don't believe they got as much fuel in the seven car as they wanted to. They just had a discussion about it and decided that they were right on the mark. That's to get to the end of the race. And so if they need to back him down later in this run, maybe with 10 laps to go or so, they're going to do it if they're in a good position. It's that close for Justin Allgaier, Kelly. Well, it's not close at all for Daniel Suarez in this 19 car. He has only continued to extend his points lead at the top of the chase standings. His crew chief, Scott Graves, telling me that he has done such a great job of not making any mistakes during this chase, staying out of trouble and managing his nerves when he got a little bit aggressive on that restart, trying to get by the seven. The team reminded him, stay focused on the end result, which is, of course, getting to Miami. Kelly Ryan Reed may be having the best run of the year right now. Currently, he's in the fourth position. They came into this race saying, listen, we have to race the seven and we have to race the 11. So far, they're beating the 11, but they're losing to the seven right now. But the biggest number for them, they are currently out of the chase right now by six points for that 16 car. He said it's a little bit tighter on these two tires, Mike. And Marty, as the laps wind down, the clock is nearing midnight for the Cinderella story of this chase. That would be Blake Cook. He's now faded a little bit. He's four points off the cutoff. The car has not shown any significant gain in speed. He's been fading. He lost the spot over the last couple of laps and has not made any progress toward the front. But something needs to happen for the 11 to get into this championship four in Homestead. Marty? Mike, four drivers will go to Miami with a chance to win the championship. The driver in the number four seat right now is Eric Jones, the heavy favorite coming into this chase, just plus four above the cut line currently in the 10th position. He has not said a word on the radio, and those two tires seem to be settling in with these other four tires being very patient, trying to get around that three car of Ty Dillon. They have Old Faithful, their car that has won three of the four races they've won this year. They're hoping Old Faithful comes through one more time tonight. It doesn't need to win. It just needs to run up front enough to get them to Miami with a shot to win the title. Behind them, Elliot Sadler. He is kind of being patient tonight is the best way to describe it. Every time a spotter, Brett, Brett, Brett Griffin gives him an update of where they are in points. He also includes the point standings and where they need to do and what they need to do right now to maintain that position. They keep preaching patience to that one car and just hold the spot that you have for now. And that's what he's been doing, holding that spot. Right now, 10 points above the line. Rick, those are some great reports, but I, I, 
my, my pulse went up a little bit when the report from Justin Allgaier's camp came in that they're questioning if they have enough fuel. I mean, with 21 laps to go, running out of fuel, even halfway down the backstretch will be enough points. So you see right here, the gas man goes over, makes an adjustment, comes back, grabs the gas can. He has to have a clean plug right here with the gas can. He doesn't, he kind of fumbles, hits the car a little bit. Not really sure how much fuel he got in. And obviously we've had to report it. It's barely enough. So I think in these last 20 laps, we're going to have to really monitor the radio of Justin Allgaier. Jeff, you and I were looking at the timing and scoring. He has a second and a half back to Suarez. Two and a half, almost three seconds back to Ryan Reed. So he does have a five point cushion, but man, that is stressful to start giving up positions this late in the race. Well, he hadn't slowed down at all yet. Right. He just ran a 27.80. The leader ran a 27.70. And third race ran a 28 flat. So, you know, listen, I think you got to slow him down. I think you just slow down as we see a great battle here. But I, ultimately, you got to finish this race. You got to, you, you cannot run out of fuel. So I think you have to back him down to build some insurance. It was two and three wide there for Ricky Stenhouse Jr. in the 60. Ryan Reed in the 16. Again, Ryan Reed running. In the fifth there position. they are telling him now, guys. Roll out of it. Save some fuel. So I think this is this is drama at its best right here with 19 laps to go. Remember, there is no fuel gauge in this car. So when Jason Burdett thinks he's sure that's just Nagar's crew chief. He's up there doing the calculations. How much fuel have they burned? How much fuel they put in? They measure that by actually weighing the gas can, right. how many pounds of fuel they put in. But there's a lot of assumptions that are made in fuel strategy and fuel mileage. And, and I can assure you, I'm no mathematician, but assumptions and math don't go well together because you can assume two or three things. If you're wrong, a little bit on a decimal here and a little bit on a decimal here, we're talking, you can run out of gas in the middle of three and four, and be eliminated. That's well, right. listen, they told him to slow down, and he went quicker. He ran yeah. a 27.80, and then he just ran a 27.70. So that is the that, – now, that happens from time to time. For some reason, you know, you can tell the driver, hey, slow down, and they actually pick up speed by using less throttle. I know, Steve. I know. Don't say anything. <laughs> but, you know, he just ran a 27.79. You don't need to run that fast right, right now. Back this thing down to a 28.20, 28.30. Half a second slower is just fine. Eric Jones finally got by the three, but as quickly as he did, the three moves back to the inside to try to take the position back. Try to use this lap car as a pick. I think they're going to split him and go three wide off the corner here. They do. Ty Dillon way down the racetrack, and he will be back in front of Eric Jones now. And again, with just saving a little fuel here, you're still driving away. With Justin Allgaier. Saving Algar. a little fuel, he's straight away here. He's into the throttle there. Running second right now. He's almost four seconds behind Kyle Busch. But more importantly, he's two seconds in front of Daniel Suarez. Again, Allgaier currently has a five-point advantage over the line, over that cut line. So that's five positions. He can give up four. But what he can't do is run out of gas and give up five. He, he blew five positions, six positions. His championship hopes are gone. And Eric Jones, look is, at this. He is in a battle with Brandon Poole, and this is not the battle he wants to be in. But ever since he slid through his pit box early in this race, they have raced from behind, and, and his comfortable points cushion is gone at only four points. Points could change hands very quickly. He is right on the cut line. This is closing in on the back bumper now of the 22. That will be for the ninth position. Marty. And just for the record, Chris Lambert, the spotter for Eric Jones, has not said a word about points, where they are, anything. So Eric's kind of flying blind here. He doesn't know that right now they're just number four seed and four points above the cut line. So he's kind of doing it all on his own. That's no word to him about where they are in the championship standings. And it seems Lambert on two. Big picture with plus four on the 11. Really can't get hurt right here. There's information that has come to the 20, but it is, by the way, 12 laps to go. But that information was to the spotter. That's right. That information wasn't from the spotter to the driver yet. You heard him saying, hey, Lambert, that's coming from the pit road to the spotter. That doesn't mean that the driver heard that. And I would say maybe communication has been an issue with the 20 team tonight because, remember, they were the ones who also didn't tell him he was doing a two-tire stop, and he sat in his pit stall waiting to see if they were going to change the left side tires for about two seconds before he went on. Yeah, I mean, to be quite honest, I, I think this is the time that Eric Jones needs to know his situation. I'm not sure passing the 22 right here. You see how hot 
the brake rotors are trying to complete this pass. You know, we've seen a few tires be damaged tonight. I'm, I just, you know, part of points racing is, is expectations and managing the game plan. You have to understand the game plan. And right now, the game plan for the 20 is to advance to Miami. It's not to pass the 22 of, of Brad Keselowski. That's kind of unnecessary. And he's had some close calls tonight, and just recently. We're still plus four. There you go. And that was to Look at how driver. close Mike Harmon is here. Very close to catching that left rear quarter panel. And we go back to the seven car. We've been talking about the situation they're in, even needing to save fuel. And Justin's backed up a little bit. The lap before he ran a 28. 20. Remember, he had run a 27.70. This lap, he ran a 28.18. So, Justin Algarder has backed his speed down. Still has a second and a half ahead of Austin Dillon. So, in eight seconds ahead of St. Louis Jr. So, he can still back up more. Dave. And Jeff, they, he did ask about how many laps he needed to save, and they said that we were right on it. And then they told him every trick in the book, driver. Jeff, how many tricks are there to save fuel? Lift early, accelerate late. You can even shut it off. I mean, it's hard to do. I've seen drivers actually shut it off uh, and then clutch it, get it fired back up. I never had the skill or ability to do that, but <laughs> some drivers can. Well, it's winding down now. Eight laps to go. And again, the big question mark is, can the seven of Justin Allgaier get to the checkered flag? Can he get to the end of this race? Does he have enough fuel? And will Eric Jones be able to hang on to the four-point lead he has over the cut line. Well, think about Blake Cook. He's four below. But he needs to understand the situation the seven is as well. Don't put yourself in a mistake. Seven laps to go. The seven might trip up and make a mistake. A and a, get Blake Cook in. You hear lift a little bit earlier than that. Give, give a little bit back. He's still second. He still has lap time to give up. He's still running 28 flat. I mean, it's... Listen, this all, all, all may work out for Algar, but I would really want to see him running a slower pace right now. He just doesn't have anything to give up. And if we get a late caution and this race could be extended, they could really be in trouble. As we talked about, Justin Allgaier in second. Sorry, Rick Wright in third and fourth. Austin Dillon and Ricky Stenhouse. Both of those cars chose to take four tires back on that last caution. They've really paid off, especially for Stenhouse Jr. It's a nice drive all the way up to the fourth position. It's been an incredible race. We haven't talked a lot about him because he's been out front and hasn't been challenged. But... Kyle Busch has led 185 laps of this, well, 195 laps that have been completed. So only 10 laps has he not led in this race. A dominant performance once again by the winningest driver ever in the history of the Xfinity Series. Now it gets more difficult for Justin Allgaier. You see right here the mile per hour comparison. A little bit slower than the leader, but it's one thing to give up time. But now behind him is a point. Now giving up time has turned into giving up a position. So if he continues to go slow, and lets Austin Dillon by that four point, excuse me, five point margin goes to four. And, and it continues to dwindle as he lets these cars by. Okay. And Alice Jr. is a, about a second and a half behind Algar. You see Austin Dillon right behind him. The right side of your screen, that's Kyle Busch again out in front. Keep saving here. Three to go right here. Three to go. Back in 2011, Kyle Busch led all 200 laps of this race. The 11, and Blake Cook just lost another spot. So Blake Cook now five points back. Eric Jones now with a five-point cushion. And that's the same number that Justin Allgaier has, five points. And that helps Justin. That gives him the confidence here to easily wave by the 60 of Ricky Stenhouse Jr. That position is no longer needed. And then he has about half of the front stretch back to the next car, Daniel Suarez. I think he needs to take all of that. With two laps to go, Jeff, give up that all of that distance. And what a nerve-wracking feeling. You mentioned there's no fuel gauge. You don't know if you're going to run out or not. You're just hoping you don't hear that car stutter, feel that car stutter. It is a terrible feeling. White flag goes in the air for Kyle Busch. One more time around for the 18 as well as that 7 of Justin Allgaier. Can he make it all the way back around to the checkered flag? Will he be a part of the championship forward running for the title? Kyle Busch, final time through three and four, looking for his 82nd or 86th win, coming out of four. Kyle Busch is going to win in Phoenix. Allgaier out of four. 
He'll coast across the line, and that will put him in the championship four. Daniel Suarez, a strong finish in the top five. Suarez also will advance into the championship four, and Blake Cook's run at a title has come to an end. Appreciate it. Uh, we didn't make it easy on him. We fought hard, man. Eric Jones, Justin Allgaier, Elliot Sadler, Daniel Suarez. Next week, when they race for a championship, the points will be even. Thumbs up for the seven. Checking the lug nuts. Look at the smoke inside the car. Nice accomplishment, boys. Thank you. Way to close out the year. Appreciate it. You mentioned closing out the year. Kyle, because of the way the rules are changing in the Xfinity Series, won't be able to race as many times. Full-time full -time cup drivers are not allowed to race in any of the chase races, as well as the dash for cash races, they're only allowed to race in 10 races throughout the year. And oh, by the way, this is the 10th win of the 2016 season for Kyle Busch in the Xfinity Series. He'll come out and bow to the crowd, as he has done so many times before. Across all three series, Kyle Busch has been incredible. Not only is he amazing in the Xfinity Series, he bows to the crowd. He's been great in the Truck Series and just won a championship in the Cup Series a year ago and still fighting for that title again. We see congratulations, Ryan Reed, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., Justin Allgaier. Justin Marks there, also a part of the group. Rowdy climbing back into the car. He'll make his way back to victory lane, but all smiles there for Justin Allgaier. Take a look at the lug nuts on the one of Elliott Sadler as he'll climb out of that car. Looking at the right rear. Looks like you can see four. Maybe I'm missing one, it looks like. It looks like one is missing. I, gotta, I, I can't guarantee it was four. I just, you know, obviously the fish right. standing there, but it looked like to me there was probably four. There you go. Elliot's going to come around and take a look. The situation with the missing lug nuts. If it's one, it's normally a penalty, a, a, a financial penalty to the crew chief. If it was three, the finish could be encumbered. Actually, it looks like there is a lug nut on there. Yeah, we're seeing four there. But they have to be Just tight. On. They have yeah. to be secure. So secured. if there's a lug nut on the stud, but it's not run up against the wheel, NASCAR considered that non-secured, and it might as well be missing. They don't count that lug nut. So they don't torque them. They don't see how tight they are, but they have to be touching the wheel. And it looks to me like there's a lug nut, and you can't really tell. It's hard to see from this right. angle with the dirt in the wheel and the brake dust, but NASCAR will have to look at it because, you know, the rule is that after a certain number, it becomes an issue. One is normally financial. Two, I think, is also financial. But when it gets to three, it becomes a major issue. It's an encumbered finish, and that finish doesn't count. And so that's why they're taking a very close look at this. They're also looking over at the left rear. Chad Little, one of the NASCAR officials, down there. Black shirt taking a look. And I think we need to remind, remind ourselves how we got to this situation. And, and remember, there was a point in this year where there was basically no lug nut rule. It was up to the crew chiefs and the drivers and the teams to figure out and get the wheels tight. Then the, there were some drivers that were very vocal. They felt that they were, that was not good for the sport, not good for them as drivers. So NASCAR decided to step in, and they said, okay, well, we'll make the rule, but the rule's going to be very strict. And uh, 
this is now basically where we end up with it. They're taking a very close look at this. We will follow up on it. We're also going to hear from the race winner. Kyle Busch will be in victory lane when we come back. And the celebration about to get underway for Kyle Busch in victory lane. Let's go there with Kelly Stavis. And after taking the checkered flag, Kyle Busch simply said, mission accomplished. The numbers are staggering. His 10th Xfinity Series win this year, his 10th win at this track. And together with crew chief Chris Gale, in just two seasons together, they have managed to put together 16 wins here in this season. We talked about it, Kyle, after you won the poll. What does it mean to go out on top as you say goodbye to Chris Gale? Uh, it means a lot. You know, that's what we set out to do tonight. And, um, you know, we've been really fast here at Phoenix. We've had some great race cars and Chris Gale and all these guys do such a great job each and every week preparing these things. And it's fun to, to win here. We appreciate Xfinity and everything that they do for the NASCAR series here and, um, you know, all the fans and all their support. But this NOS Energy Drink Camry was awesome tonight. I mean, I just can't say enough. We, uh, we adjusted it on, on some pit stops and Tried to make it a little bit better there, but, uh, you know, this Toyota Camry was really, really fast, so we didn't have to do much to it. And uh, great Joe Gibbs racing power under the hood. I can't say enough about that. And uh, DBX sunglasses, appreciate them. Again, Xfinity one app. I use that all the time when I'm out eating, actually. So uh, used it last night watching a truck race and uh, had some fun with that. So good to see that we've got a truck going to Homestead next week. Good to see our JGR boys did a great job here and we're able to transfer through. So looking forward to watching one of them go win a championship next week. Yeah, they did. Daniel Suarez and Eric Jones both through. Now it'll be your task to get through tomorrow. Obviously a completely different situation, but do you sleep a little bit easier tonight after a victory in this series? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it just gives you that confidence and, and the tire was definitely way different than I had imagined it was going to be. So. Uh, I've got some things that I want to talk to Adam about and, uh, you know, work on some things for our cup car for tomorrow. But we got a lot better. You know, the, the weekend didn't start off very well on the cup side with our M&M's Camry, but uh, we, we got a lot better as the weekend win. I feel like we have at least in the ballpark now. We got a top five car, so we'll go racing from there. All right, his 10th career win here just at this one racetrack. Rick. Thanks. And remember, next year, because of the way the rules have changed in the Xfinity Series, Kyle Busch won't even be able to race in this race next year. No cup drivers with five years experience in the cup series will be able to race in any of the chase races for the Xfinity Series. Marty. Rick Elliott Sadler is in by 10 points. That was what happened on the racetrack. But when you got out of the car, NASCAR officials were obviously looking at the right rear of your car, Elliott. What did they say about what happened and what they found back there? I don't know. I think we might have a loose lug uh, on the right rear. So, um, I mean, they'll look at it and and then, and then go from there. So we'll see. Hey, we did everything we were supposed to do tonight. Uh, kept the car out of trouble. Didn't run the race we wanted to run, but we wanted to be careful. We wanted to be safe, uh, especially after what happened last night in the truck race. So uh, I want to make financial guys are ready to go to Homestead, and, and uh, we've saved our best for that, and uh, we'll go in there and try to win that championship. Kevin Mandering, your crew chief, told me there's one lug nut in question, so in theory that should not be an, an encumbered finish, right? And, and yeah, yeah, I know you're trying to figure out the rules as you go along here. That would be a tough way to decide it, wouldn't it? It would. I hope it doesn't come down to that. So, uh, you know, we'll see what they what they say, and we'll go from there. But, I mean, as a team, I'm proud of my guys. We, we kept our season position all night. And we'll, uh, we, as far as I'm concerned, we'll get ready to go to Homestead and, and, uh, and do a good job for our team. I mean, Kelly and Dale have done a great job at Junior Motorsports giving us fast cars. And Justin had a great run tonight. 
So it would be neat for uh, for both of us to go to Nan and, and, and have a shot at it. Talk about how difficult your job was tonight because Brett Griffin kept telling you, you're fine where you're at. And I know you wanted to go a little bit harder, but you're kind of playing the patient game tonight. We were. We were just trying not to do anything stupid and tried to be careful. I had really had to be careful on restarts and didn't want to be three wide and didn't want to be aggressive. And it's really hard here in the restart zone where the spotters are that you don't want to get into the car in front of you and, uh, and knock your radiator out. So tonight was... Not the race we've ran all year long to get here, but it's the race that we had to run tonight. You and I were talking about this earlier this week. For the year that you've gone through to have a shot at the title, what, what significance does that have for you? Well, I, I can't wait. I'm uh, looking forward to it. And, um, you know, my parents are going to come down, and, and they have supported me so much um, in my career. And my wife and kids are coming, and they have really stood behind me every step of the way. And I, I'm just more proud for these guys. I'm more proud for my family coming down and enjoy the experience. And uh, we're pumped up about it. We, we've really put all our eggs in one basket, and that's, the, and that's our homestead car. And we want to go down there and be competitive and have a shot at it. So we've done everything we need to do to put ourselves in position. Everybody on this one-man financial team's done a great job. Now we just got to go finish it. And Rick, remember his mom, Mama Bell, has been sick for a lot of this year. So very significant for Elliot to have his family down in Homestead, Miami. Absolutely. Let's flash back. And there has been a lug nut issue with Elliot Sadler uh, a week ago at Texas. They had one lug nut loose, and that ended up being a fine for the crew chief. When you come onto pit road after the race, they check those lug nuts, and at the time they had said that it looked as though one was loose. And now the same situation has come up here at Phoenix, and it's very important. A huge situation potentially for Elliott Sadler if there's more than one lug nut that's loose. He only had a 10-point cushion over the cut line, and so now the team looking concerned as they will wait to find out. NASCAR officials have been around the car ever since it stopped on pit road. They'll ask the crew chief to come down to also look at it. So this has all changed. So before one lug nut, you lost your crew chief. One lug nut missing, you lost Cunesco, said, okay, we're going to come in, we're going to reassess this. Now one lug nut missing, as you said, L.A. Sadler and this team's already experienced. Basically, it's a monetary fine for your first offense. There is a multiplying opportunity, and it's really just to increase the fine to make sure you don't continue to have the issue. The question mark is it's very clear that if you have three missing or more, it can be an encumbered win. Encumbered Elliott Sadler, finish. Uh, encumbered finish, so NASCAR will have to discuss that. The question mark is there's verbiage out there that if you have two missing lug nuts, there is some line items in there that said it could be 15 points. Now, that says missing. Are they unsecured? Are they missing? We have to wait on NASCAR to explain what the situation is, how many lug nuts they're looking at. But the point situation is Elliott Sadler is plus 10. So, you know, any penalty over 10 points would be a major issue for this one car. But you can see the worry on their face. I mean, they are concerned. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think I think they're they're obviously concerned. And when you mention that 15-point number, what that could do is bring in Blake Cook. And so right now, Blake Cook, who thought he had missed out and potentially still might not make it into the championship four, sees a ray of hope, maybe a little bit of light here that the possibility exists he could still continue on for. A shot at the championship, and Mike is standing by with Blake. And he has been watching uh, the interview we just did with Elliot Sather, paying close attention to it. Uh, what do you make of this situation in terms of how it might affect you? Well, before I say anything about that, I really want to apologize to Bubba Wallace. Um, totally didn't know he was there trying to cross over 22, and I hit Bubba. He was having a good night. He had a rough week, so I'm sorry, Bubba. Um, but what's going on right now, I don't really know what's going on right now. Um, I just know we, we did the best we could all night. It was probably our best race of the year, and that's what we came here and we needed to do, and whatever happens, happens. We'll see where we end up. They were loose lug nuts or, or unattached lug nuts on the one car that could potentially, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but potentially be a points penalty uh, and, and may affect your situation. Uh, what do you think should happen in regards to that? I mean, the rules are the rules, so whatever happens, happens. And if I get to benefit from it, awesome. I'll, I'll take uh, my ticket to Homestead any way I can get it. Uh, but extremely proud of, of my whole team and everybody at Lee Filter Gutter Protection for believing in me and Matt Colleague for starting this race team just to put me in this situation. And most importantly, uh, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for putting people in my life to get me to this level, uh, giving me my hope and, and stay up and positive over the years and down time. So, just very thankful right now. I'm pumped up. What was the night like for you overall? You had a fast race car. 
Yeah, it was, man, I just, I had nothing to lose, so I, I that was like probably the first race in my life that I just went after it, didn't really care what happened, just super aggressive, I had the best restarts I've had all night, I, I raced the best I ever have, um, and it's good to come here and, 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 you know, I can look in the mirror tonight and know that I gave it my all, I didn't leave anything on the table, and I raced everybody clean, that's just how I race, uh, like I said, with the deal with the six was totally unintentional, I had no idea it was there, so um, we'll, we'll see what happens here in a couple minutes, though. As of right now, though, Kelly, Blake Cook is out of the chase, but uh, stay tuned. A seventh straight top five finish for Daniel Suarez, and he is easily through to the championship round in Miami. Daniel, you took a chance leaving your family in Monterey, Mexico, to come NASCAR racing. Did you dream how quickly this moment would come for you to compete for this championship? Well, one day I had a dream of what it is, but I didn't know how fast it was going to come. Um, the only thing I know is that I was working super hard to try to make it happen uh, as far as possible and right now we're in the position to do it so uh, very grateful uh, you know to be in this position and I'm very thankful as well uh, with everyone that has been making this possible Harris, Toyota, Intercept Batteries, Juniper uh, everyone that helps this program uh, to, to be here right now Coca-Cola I think it's been, a, it's been a really good journey uh, now we have to make it happen in the most important race of the year in Homestead. You were poised for a top three finish, and I heard your team telling you, keep the big picture in mind. Did you have to back it down there at the end of it? I feel, I feel like we, we couldn't finish in the top three, maybe, maybe third. Um, but, you know, 25 laps ago, I was, I was pushing it hard, but I didn't want to either run out of brakes or blew a, a tire or something crazy happened. So. Well, I wasn't in the position to, to take that risk, so another top five, we take it. You know the track ahead of you at Homestead, Miami. You know the car you'll be driving. How do you like your chance versus the other three competitors? I, I like it. Uh, that's one of my favorite cars. Uh, actually, it's the car that, that we won in Michigan. So it's a really good car. Uh, we've been saving that baby for, for Homestead, and, and there we go. All right, congratulations. Thank you. And so the four drivers right now, we believe that will race for a championship are Elliott Sadler, Justin Allgaier, Daniel Suarez, and Eric Jones. For more on the Elliott Sadler story, stay tuned. Now it's time for the post-race show. We send it over to Chris Devota, Kyle Petty, and Dale Jarrett. This copyrighted telecast may not be reproduced, retransmitted, or used in any form without the authorized written consent of NASCAR Broadcasting. NASCAR would like to thank all of our fans for your support, and we hope you enjoy today's broadcast.
uh, I think it was Jeff Burton or Steve Latart set up there at one time during the race. These guys in the pits today and the calls they made always seemed to be one call behind what everybody else was doing. They didn't need to play a strategy. They had a fast car. They, they run up front. They were playing their strategy right until a mistake was made. And that's what concerns me about going in the homestead and concerns me. The pressure was on these last 10 races, and as the pressure has amped up, there's been cracks in this team. Yeah, we've, we've talked about they've had speed, and there's no doubt about that. He's a very talented driver, but the execution is lacking. I'm not sure that they're performing at a level that you can expect a championship caliber team and effort to be put forth. You can't just turn it back on. Uh, you know, these things happen, and they have to be in the back of your mind. So can they put it all together? All the ingredients are there. They have everything, yes. but it's going to take a mistake-free day next Saturday afternoon if they plan for uh, Eric Jones to be the champion. Yeah, Eric Jones trying to join the ranks of Johnny Benson, Austin Dillon, Greg Biffle to win both the Truck Series and Xfinity Series championship. What about Justin Allgaier? He moves on as well. He is with Dave Burns. Well, that was nerve-wracking for Justin Allgaier at the end. They're being told you had to save fuel, and then you went faster. Were you worried that you weren't saving? Uh, I think they were worried that I wasn't saving. You know, the the guys down in the pit box, uh, Jason Burdett and all of our all of our crew did an awesome job all night. And when he said save, I, I kind of got a, a little bit disappointed. I'm like, man, I am saving. He's like, no, you don't understand. Save a lot. So we were a little shorter on fuel than we'd like to be. I ultimately had to give up second and third, but still a solid night. Um, I can't thank everybody back at Junior Motorsports enough for giving us great race cars. Uh, to be able to have the opportunity to go for a championship next week to do what we needed to do tonight it, it was it was pretty special and i have to say my daughter harper is at home watching this we just facetimed with her she's up way too late she's up way past her bedtime so harper i love you but you need to go to bed now sweetie and uh you know this sport is so much fun these fans here were awesome tonight the atmosphere is electric so uh can't thank xfinity nascar for all that they do for our sport and the fans it's it's going to be so much fun going to homestead next week knowing that we got a shot at a championship well and i think you have a shot because you showed speed you raced with kyle bush there on that restart little little bumper tag there with him what was that save like uh you know that that probably was uh a little bit of I've dominated this race and, and you know, you get out of my way. But uh, at the same time, I hats off to Kyle. They did a great job all night. They were definitely the, the car to beat. I felt like we had a second place car. We got the track position. We had the speed. Unfortunately, we just had to had to save too much fuel at the end. But great call by Jason to take two tires. Uh, I'm just glad that it didn't it, that it worked out that we had enough fuel to make it the checker flag. Justin Allgaier, part of the championship four at Homestead Miami. Yes, he is. And the Jason he's talking about is crew chief Jason Burdett, uh, three-year-old Harper, of course, Justin's biggest fan. And Justin has sort of been under the radar, uh, DJ, if you will, in this chase, at least in this round, because Elliot Sadler and Daniel Suarez have been so on. Yeah, they have. But I will say, I've lost a little bit of my confidence in Justin and the team. Yet They had performed so well leading up to the chase, and then it just hadn't gone. They'd worked their way through, but I wasn't sure they were going to be able to put together the race tonight that they had to, to have. But I'm very proud of him. He did an outstanding job. I mean, he raced his tail off here tonight, did everything right, and uh, got the job done, did exactly what he needed to do. And so now he's got that opportunity. He's got three cars that he has to beat. He doesn't have to win the race. It may take that, probably will next week, but he's got three drivers that he has to beat, and he can be the champion. Yeah, and here's a team. We were talking about Eric Jones a minute ago. Here's a team that's 180 degrees, or tonight was 180 degrees from where the Eric Jones team was. They did everything to perfection. He drove the car like he should have driven the car or like he wanted to drive the car. Adjustments worked. Pit strategy was perfect. And I'm going to say something else. He was excited. Yeah. I like to see yeah. somebody be excited. You know, obviously there's a little bit of cloud out there over Elliot Sadler, so he's going to be a little bit different. Eric Jones, I didn't see a lot of excitement from him, but from Daniel Suarez and, and from Justin Allgaier, here's two guys that have been looking forward to getting to Miami, to getting in that chase and having an opportunity at that championship. And that's what you want to see from guys, excitement about winning a championship. Yeah, Daniel Suarez, 24 years old from Monterey, Mexico. Justin Algar, been in the sport for a long time, 30 from Riverton, Illinois. They know they are advancing to the championship race in Homestead. But there is still a question mark as NASCAR officials continue to talk. We will continue to keep you updated on Elliott Sadler. They're acting like they're going to make a call on this now. Yeah, and that, you know, they, I can't believe they would leave them loose tonight because they weren't even, their pit stops weren't even that good, you know? They weren't, they weren't even, yeah, they weren't pushing. They weren't pushing anything. Yeah. Yep. But, you know, like last week, they didn't make a call they're, on uh, what, Tuesday? 
They're meeting okay. in the NASCAR so hall right now, guys, just okay. so you know. Thanks, Marty. Hey. And they kind of they kind of blew Kevin Mandering off, so told yes. him he couldn't come in. We saw so. that shot. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, they act like that's, the way they're going about it, it's like, we're going to make a call. And Well, I think it's two different things. Like last week it was one lug nut loose. This, this time it might be two. And so there are two different penalties for 18 and 19. What? 18 and 19. Oh, yeah. Kelly with Ryan Reed. I thought it was only if you got down, if you had more than three loose. I think it's. That's for an yep. encumbered finish, DJ. The three loose thing. Yeah, is it my understanding, Marty, is it because of Texas? Like it's the multiplier thing is the issue? I, I don't know if there's a multiplier. I don't okay. think there is a multiplier okay. on this. One was one was one loose and this one's two from my understanding, not official. Xfinity Series race complete here in Phoenix International Raceway. Elliot Sadler, driver of the one car, advancing, but there is still a question mark on a lug nut rule. He, you see him walking into the Xfinity Series hauler where NASCAR officials are waiting to discuss that. But of course, they weren't the only players in the race. Other chase drivers, Kelly Stavis caught up with one of them. Well, it was a valiant effort by Ryan Reed and the 16 team coming away with a sixth place finish. It just wasn't quite enough, Ryan. Uh, but how will you reflect on being a part of this championship race? Well, it was uh, certainly really cool. Thank you to Xfinity uh, for, for giving us this opportunity to do this type of format. I think it's so exciting for the fans. I'm really broken hearted. We're not going to be uh, at Homestead racing for a championship. We'll be there, but you know, not part of the final four. But man, I'm so proud of these guys. Uh, we made such a great run. and. Uh, I just hope that, you know, I mean, I know I certainly took away and I hope my guys did that just never give up. You know, halfway through the season, people kind of wrote us off and, uh, you know, this this tonight showed that, uh, you know, we'll be back next year and we'll, we'll make another deep run. And uh, I think we're going to contend for a championship next year. So uh, a lot to be proud of this year um, and, and a lot of growth this year. So I'm excited where we finished up. I uh, wish we were a couple spots better there, but we gave it all we could. Yeah, talk about that journey because you guys seem to be in a significantly better position and better as a team than the start of the year. I mean, I have uh, I have the best guys around me. You know, they have my back. They complement my strengths and, and help my weaknesses. But, I mean, if anyone at home can take anything away from this, it's just don't give up. Uh, you know, there are so many people that, you know, like I said, wrote us off, you know, said the 16, you know, he's just wasting a spot out there. And, uh, you know, they, they really, you know, my guys and myself really use that as motivation. Uh, and we dig deep and are really proud of what we've, we've shown we can do and what we're going to continue to do. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thanks. Well, you have to love that interview and that, that message, don't give up. That is exactly yeah. what he said after he won in Daytona a couple of years ago. Ryan Reed races with diabetes. He qualified third, finished sixth. Kyle, they know he was here. Yeah, and, and that's the way this kid's lived his whole life. And, and I, I think tonight was a perfect example. They didn't give up. Uh, did we write him off? I don't think we wrote him off, but I, I don't believe that if, if we look at the Roush cars, that they had the speed that the Junior Motorsports cars and that the Toyotas have had all year long. So once they got to this round of eight, they were a little bit behind the eight ball. But I'm telling you, he did get everything you could get out of that car tonight. He put it in the position. If somebody else made a mistake, he was there to pounce and to move on the homestead. Yeah, even though he just started the night five points outside of that, that fourth spot, we didn't really talk about him because we had not seen any signs that they would be that good. But he and Bubba Wallace were outstanding tonight. That's the fastest race cars they've had all year. I'm wanting to know why they didn't try these things before <laughs> now. Go ahead and give it your best shot, yeah. you know. But the good thing is, as he said, they've got things to build on. It's a very talented young man that has lived his life that way. He is the perfect example of don't ever give up. And, and so for him to be able to say that, that should give everybody a lot of hope. Yeah, and even though they didn't make, the, make, make it on the homestead, they should leave here tonight holding their head high. Yeah. They gave it an effort. They gave it a valiant effort, and, and they made it to the round of eight. And there's a lot of other teams that ran a race tonight that didn't make it that far. So tip of the hat to Ryan Reed and the whole Roush organization, even with everything that happened with Bubba and the guys that didn't make it on the homestead. Good night for you guys. Yeah, Ryan Reed, Bubba Wallace, both in the chase coming into this race. They have been eliminated, as have Brendan Gaughan and Blake Cook. Blake Cook in the green T-shirt talking to Justin Algeyer. Algeyer moves on. 
they're great friends and, and they're waiting. They're actually still here at the track. Everyone is because we're still waiting on the fate of the driver of the number one, Elliot Sadler. Hey, post-race friends. Yes. yes, Marty. Hey, so I did confirm the penalty at Texas was one lug nut loose. Okay. So if this is different than, if, if it's one lug nut tonight, then nothing's going to happen. If it's two lug nuts tonight, what likely will happen is that, uh, is that um, Kevin will have to sit at home next week because that's just a $10,000 fine and uh, one race suspension. Okay, but Elliot would still be okay. Elliot would still be there. Yeah, there's no points or anything. And right? I got yeah. Miller, everybody. Huh? Okay. You have him, Marty, right now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. But it's no points, right? Yes, ma'am. It's a severe one, but that's only if there's only Yeah. Well, if Marty has Scott, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So if it's two. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, but what? in what's Scott's title? Grand Poopa. Okay. <laughs> the guy that talks when nobody else wants to. Hey, Big Show. Scott That's Miller's his title. title. Thank you. <laughs> I like Kyle's title better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a full moon in two, two more nights. That's a good point. One more night. <laughs> Should I just move? No, I'm no matter, change science. No matter where we're going to be, it's It'll going to be a full, full moon. Just I know, but I say, it, you, I it's going to be a full moon here into, in two nights. I need it to said. play into here my, in two nights. my story. Just so y'all know, it'll be a full moon here in two nights. <laughs> and I don't know about it on the East Coast. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Here in Phoenix, the race complete, but we are all on the edge of our seats trying to find out what is happening with the number one. They have advanced to the championship race in Homestead, but there was a question with the lug nuts following the race. Marty Snyder has been standing outside the Xfinity Series hauler, and he joins us now with Senior Vice President of Competition. Yes, Scott Miller indeed here with us. And Scott, so what is the verdict for the number one car in Elliott Sadler? Well, the unfortunate situation is the inspectors found uh, two lug nuts that weren't up against the wheel. So what that's going to mean is, uh, as it states in the rule book, that it's a crew chief suspension. So unfortunately, Elliott will have to be uh, racing at Homestead with a substitute crew chief. But to clarify, there is no points penalty for that. So they will still be in the championship for Kevin Mandering, his crew chief, just will not be his crew chief next week, correct? Yeah, that's uh, that's what the rule book says. So two, two lug nuts off is a, a large fine and a crew chief suspension for one race. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the situation we're in right now going into Homestead. Now, last week they had a lug nut violation as well. That was f for one lug nut, however. This is two, you're saying. There's not a multiplier or anything that really carries over from Texas, is there? Uh, not, not, that would, uh, not that would in any way, shape, or form affect points. Um, we'll review all that and see uh, if it's a fine escalator or whatever. We haven't looked into that yet. All right, Scott, thanks for your time. Yes, sir, thank you. All right, Chris, so to clarify, Elliot Sadler is indeed in the championship for Kevin Mannering, his crew chief, will be suspended for Homestead Miami next week, but Elliot will be racing for a championship. Thank you, Marty. And yeah, that's the question. The the answer uh, we were all waiting for is uh, we kind of were we all there was a collective again holding of your breath because Elliot Sadler doing everything they needed to do to get into this chase uh, into the championship race. You see Elliot there looking at the wheel. It is unfortunate for his crew chief Kevin Mendering, but I think there was this um, 
if you will, yeah. that Elliott will be racing for the title next weekend. Yeah, there's no doubt. And I'm really shocked that this happened tonight. You know, I understand when you're racing for wins and things like that, but they were taking every precaution. And even their normally fast pit crew, it, it seemed like we're kind of taking their time tonight. So it's, it's a little surprising they even were in this situation. And it's disappointing that the two of them that have made it this far won't be working together. But with, in today's yeah. world, with all the technology and everything they have, he won't be too far away that they can't talk. But it still won't be exactly the same. Yeah, I, I, I agree. To put themselves in this position, they really didn't need to be in this position. And, I, and I've got to say this. I'm glad there's only one more race left because obviously somebody is slipping me the NASCAR Kool-Aid. Uh, because I've agreed, I'm going to agree with NASCAR on this call, and and I've not been agreeing with them over over the past couple of weeks on things they've done, uh, and we'll criticize them. But they made this call, and they made it incredibly fast. They put it out there. Scott Miller came and talked to us. Tip of the hat to him for coming and talking to us, setting the record straight, telling us where it's at, telling the other championship contenders, getting it out, getting it over with. We don't have to wait until Tuesday at the R&D Center. We don't have to wait for a press conference on Wednesday. This is Chase, and this has Chase implications, and NASCAR did a great thing by going in the truck, discussing it, understanding what the rules are, coming out, explaining them to the fans and to all of us, ruling on it, and then moving on down the highway. I got to go. I, I got to applaud them for that. Yeah, well, I was thinking Elliot Sadler, he now knows his fate, but Blake Cook as well. You know, Blake Cook was yeah, sort of waiting yeah. because if something had happened, Blake Cook was that first driver out. Uh, but again, Elliot Sadler will join Daniel Suarez, Justin Allgaier, and Eric Jones next week competing for the championship in Miami. Yeah, and, and you know, when we started this chase uh, back at Kentucky, those were the four drivers that everybody pretty much had set their sights on. These were the ones that had competed at what we thought was the highest level and, and looked like they could move on. But what it showed us was nothing was secure until the very end of this. I mean, we secure lug nuts weren't even yeah. there, so that could have had an effect. And so, uh, but they, I think probably the four best team, but Blake Cook and, and his team did an outstanding job in, in trying to make that run, as did Ryan Reed here, uh, and just came up a little bit short. Yeah, and, and we heard, you know, we, we heard Elliot Sadler say, he didn't run the race he wanted to run. He didn't drive the way he wanted to drive. He didn't do the things he wanted to do because of what happened to, to um, William Byron last yeah. night in yep. the truck race. Yep. You never knew what was going to happen. And they didn't want to be caught in that position where something happened to them, a broken, broken engine, a, a wheel coming loose, something happened to them. That's why I'm, I'm with Dale. They never put themselves in position to have to fight for anything tonight. They didn't put themselves in position on pit road to have to fight to beat somebody off pit road. So to, so to have this happen to them, um, I didn't understand that. Yeah. And, and the part of the story, in case you're missing it, William Byron leading the race last yes. night. Uh, again, their chase. Uh, lost an engine uh, after winning six races this year. Uh, William Byron does not move on to the championship race next week. So